This week, three sides of the coin, we have a special guest that drops some minutia bombs. This guy was responsible for taking the makeup off and putting the makeup back on. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Hey everybody, welcome back to Three Sides of the Coin. I am one of your three co-hosts, Michael Brandvold. And as always, and I'm saying this because it pisses somebody off, and I can't remember who it was, that this is how I introduced you guys. But as always, I'm joined by Tommy Summers and Mark Cicchini. That bothered somebody? I've never yeah. even noticed. Said there was that. somebody made a comment about how they didn't like that, that it it's I don't know, I don't know, it was condescending to you or something. Uh, you know, it's just another reason to be pissed at me and hate me. Thank you. I want you to yeah. hate me because if you hate me, somebody else will love me. I just heard that. Hey, we're a little, <laughs> hold on, a little foreshadowing <laughs> to a part of an interview. Exactly. So, um, Tommy, I let's skip comments today. Oh, I have one. Oh, you do? Okay, go for it. Yeah. This is in the latest episode uh, that you guys just did with the author of the Kiss My Black Ass book, which is a very cool book. Um, I'm just going to spell it S-T-R-T-O-F-D-R-M-S on YouTube. He said, or she, the coolest feeling was going into the record store and seeing a new album by your favorite band and having no idea it was coming out. That is something that the internet has made irrelevant, and I miss that feeling. I can totally agree with that because we were in Amoeba more than once this weekend in L.A., and I came across some things I'd never seen before. I got a Blondie DVD CD box set thing that I had no idea was out. And that, man, finding that for the first time is so incredibly exciting. He's right. That is a – I'm not disagreeing with that feeling, but I've had that on the Internet because if you don't – all it comes down to is if you don't know your band is releasing something – I've been to a band's website where I'm like, holy crap, they released an album last year? I never heard about it. And I immediately go to iTunes and download it. So it's, yeah. the, it's the same feeling. It is. Yeah, I guess I hadn't had that experience. But from the record store perspective, is there's something really magical, oh, yeah. at least from to picking physically going, <gasps> wow, check this out. You so know? Especially when you're walking into the record store maybe to buy something else and you discover that. Like I, yeah. my, you know, mine was I was walking into the record store to buy Killers, which wasn't there, and all of a sudden there was Creatures of the Night. There you go. Yeah. So great comment. Um. So I wanted to just do a little um, reminiscing here. It just dawned on me earlier today. We're recording this on Tuesday, January thirty first. Sixteen years ago today, I destroyed the Kiss Harmony. For the very first time. 16 years ago today, Kiss announced Eric Singer was returning to the band and going to wear the cat makeup. And I was working for Kiss at that time, and I I have such distinct memories of that. Like, it was like, I think it was the day before the announcement. I'm assuming it was probably Tommy Thayer or it might have been management. Email. I had no idea this was happening. Bear with me on that. I had no idea. Emailed me these two pictures, a band photo and a photo of Eric in makeup. This needs to be posted tomorrow, and here's the announcement to go with it. And I'm sitting there looking at this going, holy crap. Outside of management and KISS, I'm the only other person that knows about this right now. Wow. And, you know, and it was just like, I'm just like, this is huge. I mean, this is huge. Eric Singer's returning to the band, replacing Peter, and he's wearing the cat makeup. And I'm looking at the very first pictures before any other fan ever saw them. And I remember when you posted that, too. And I and I, then I distinctly remember on Kiss Online posting it. And then I remember shit hitting the fan. <laughs> just oh, all yeah. over the wall <laughs> and you couldn't say anything I, you know i just you know i it wasn't for me to have my personal opinion about it right but you would have loved to have i mean imagine the fight you could have had oh the, <laughs> can't the, get the, that you that, can't get that day that, back that, that is where that is where the the kiss army 
splintered. Yep. At that point, a good chunk just went off. And believe me, if you think there's people that are pissed about Tommy, you did not experience that first day when that photo of Eric was posted. Oh, my God, did that just surprise the hell out of people. I bet. Oh, and I remember you posting it. I remember seeing all of the comments, but I remember going, oh, my God, you know, because that was a revelation. You know, you thought that they were going to all stay together forever once you know, the makeup went back you on. You know what? As somebody who was on – when I was on the uh, this expo circuit, do you remember the wanted posters that some asshole fucking yep. printed up right after that? I mean, just totally disrespectful, just totally stupid. I mean, because people now, they, they're so used to the, t- the time of the ace thing. But when that happened, I mean, if you were an active fan back then, Man, holy hell broke loose. Oh, it just, just, again, you just have no idea how it exploded. Just, it was huge. Fans had no idea it was even coming. Just none whatsoever. You just woke up one day, and the farewell tour that was going to Japan with Peter Chris is now going with Eric Singer in makeup. And here he is. And, you know, I've told the story about how when the Lick It Up album came out, I just stared at them out of makeup, just looking at everything. I did that with, you know, sorry, Eric, but I was just staring intently into your eyes in that photo because it was just like, oh, my God, that's Eric Singer. And he's got makeup on. And it was, you know, you were just trying to take it all in because it was so different at that moment. And it came from left field. Oh, totally. But a lot of people, once that tour started, and the first bootlegs hit because if you remember, they started playing medleys at the end. Yep. Yeah. And and boy, I just uh, again because I was so in the fan community, there was a nice blowback from that. I mean, people were like, "Holy crap! Look what they're doing with Eric that they couldn't do." You know what I mean? Just they seemed like they were having more fun. Oh, they were Even definitely AC. they were definitely having a lot more fun because I saw them in Australia, and I think you'll you guys will all agree that. If fans get into discussions about KISS lineups they wish they could have seen or a KISS lineup that they wish could have recorded an album. That's the one. This is the lineup. Gene, Paul, Eric Singer, and Ace Frehley is probably the top lineup that people want to see and wish would have recorded an album. Yeah, I mean, I I never saw that uh, incarnation of the band. It was it was it was great. They were they were truly having fun in Australia. I mean, granted, you could see the moments of uncomfortableness on stage, especially from Gene when the pre-planned show didn't go pre-planned because Ace starts this medley and this jam. But there was a vibe of just having fun. You could almost feel like the pressure of the original four had been lifted off of them. And keep in mind, we talked about this on the show, that last final show, how much animosity, how much turmoil the band was in. And now compare those last shows to what they did in Australia and Japan. It's night and day. Oh, I mean, big time. You, don't even, you don't even have to be a fan of the band to see it. I mean, the, the vibe was totally different. Um, you know, and again, you know what? These shows are available on YouTube to see these jams. Go look, go look them up. Yeah, go to YouTube. They're a lot of fun. And again, I I just remember when the when the the bootlegs were coming out then because they're coming fast and furious. Again, you know, kind of like our uh, our uh, foreshadowing too about CD burners and people sending uh, shows. Uh, you know, boy, oh boy, I remember when I got those. I was just listening intently. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. They were so great. You know, and part part of what was fun was they do these medleys, and you'd be like, "What's going to be in the medley tonight?" Because mm-hmm. it wasn't a rehearsed, pre-planned medley. It was like, "What? Where?" Because Ace was sort of taking the lead with it. Yes. And where was Ace going to go with it? And what would they try and play? And that 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 it it was very much like the conventions when they tried to do things but it didn't quite work out and they may have stopped after 20 seconds but that was kind of the vibe that was happening and you're right gene did not seem to embrace that the way the other three did yeah you i mean it's visible when, yeah. when you 
Yeah, he he he, he played along, but you could yes. see it was very much like the Tom Snyder show. He played along with the interview, but if you watch his body language, it's not loose and happy. <laughs> but those are great things to seek out. Uh, the uh, uh, the Australian tour uh, and the Japanese tour of uh, two thousand one. Those yep. are great. Matter of fact, there's a pro shot um, from Japan. Um, available online from 2001 on YouTube. Um, right, Tommy, I have the CD and the DVD. Of course, of course you, you do. do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that I didn't even get a chance to look at all that stuff you have this weekend. I completely forgot. So, so let let's let's move on here. So, you two guys just got back. I don't know, yesterday, Literally. day before, <laughs> from Los Angeles. You had your swingers convention in LA over the weekend, right? Let me tell you what a we. I don't think we stopped laughing from the time we got there till the time we left. It was just insults and jokes the whole freaking time we so were you, there. You, you guys, you guys went down to the L.A. Kiss Expo. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, guys, who who everybody who was down there. I couldn't make it. Um, literally, I was home while taking care of a sick daughter who was covered with a rash for two days. Um, yeah, a lot of people ask, "Where's Michael? Where's sorry. Michael?" I mean. Just, a lot of yeah. people said, fuck Michael. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, there were a few. <laughs> Who? Name them. Name them. I don't know. I don't know. Mark They're Tachini. All from the Mark Tachini, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it was, yeah, people were everyone. So many people were like, where's Michael? Why isn't Michael here? I'm like, so, just so, couldn't. So you guys, so. take over the show. You guys, tell us about the LA Kiss Expo trip. And the expo and yeah. Izzy and fucking a, Izzy. Magical. Oh, Izzy. I, 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 we can start by Tom. Tommy, you got there, yeah, because you were there a day before I was. So. Yeah, I showed up a day before and I stayed. <laughs> I stayed with Izzy the first night, which that in itself was an adventure. Did it was that like scare you. No, but it was like it was like I was twenty years old again, and I was staying in the animal house. It was like house. being in college, right? In a dorm. Totally. Room. But, you know, Iz, to his credit, was sober uh, nice, uh, as I knew he would be, and very, very accommodating. I mean, he even cleaned before I showed up. Okay. All right. Now, let me ask you, what his definition of cleaning, what is that, actually? I think probably (laughs) dumping cigarette butts, empty beer cans, and and getting rid of uh, all of his porn. I don't know. You know? (laughs) But uh, yeah, no, I, 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 Izzy's a great friend and and such a super super nice guy, and so we just hung out the first night. Did he treat night you to and, a Seven Eleven pizza? Uh, no, because we went to uh, Grill Em All, which is a burger joint that's the Metallica themed type or metal burger grill. It's like Marty's okay. place, you know, heavy metal grill, but Marty's food is twenty times better. You know, uh, Grill Em All was with the staff was nice and and everything was great, but the burgers were more like going to Fuddruckers. It was just big fucking oh, yeah. slab of beef. And I, I love it, Fuddruckers though. I know, but that's okay though. But for me, I'm just like, you know, and we were in L.A., so I'm like, okay, Thai, you know, uh, you know all that, you know, uh, Mexican. <laughs> there's so many at Thai. Uh, and so we spent the first evening together. We we got on the train. We went down to Hollywood Boulevard and banged around for a while and went to Amoeba Records, Amoeba Records, which is fantastic, uh, and just had a great night hanging out and talking. And it was a lot of fun. And you and did you did next... you did his podcast right? Yeah, I did his podcast. Yes, that was pretty funny. And then he cooked dinner, which was great. It was actually excellent. He is a good cook. Uh, so we did this podcast, sang, sat around drinking uh, beer and Jack Daniels, and we went to um, the Jack Rainbow, Daniels? I oh. think. No, not the Rainbow. <laughs> yeah. We went to um, Loaded, a place on Hollywood Boulevard where a lot of a lot of music people hang out. So it was a cool little bar. So it was fun. Anybody recognize you as the great Tommy, Th- Tommy Thayer? Tommy Summers? I, <laughs> no. Uh, actually, where did we? Yeah, I ran into, I ran into a listener of the show at... Um, at the uh, at Amoeba Records. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in there buying stuff, um, but it was nice, you know. Izzy's a good, good guy. So then on uh, Friday, I picked uh, Mark up from the airport, and it was just kind of pretty much game on from that time on. <laughs> you know? oh my God, that was fun. All right, so tell me, go go into the details. Well, we That's we the after dark episode. We're not 
filling that shit here. That's this is comic gold. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we we know we rented a convertible and got to use it a couple of days, which was awesome. And uh, we got a chance to to hang out and do a lot of fun stuff. We had lunch with Eric a couple times. He's as nice as nice can be, and just it was great. You know, the first day was was fun as hell. And did you go to just... the expo event on Friday, which was Peter's VIP? No, no we were we were hanging out um, all afternoon, and then we were just having a bunch of fun, just sightseeing and doing other stuff and then um i got a hold of eric and we went out to dinner um three of us that night and we sat there you know long after our dinner just talking laughing having a good time and then as a matter you know all serious i'd been up since before 5 a.m and we're we're shit we're out we're at now california time like 10 o'clock at night or something and that tommy I, I so did i wanted to go to out with izzy because that's where tommy went after yeah we, we went to the rainbow yeah, after we had dinner with Eric, and I was I, the energy level just I I couldn't fucking move. I was just dead tired. So because that would have been like I don't know one in the morning or something, Eastern Standard, and I I was just falling apart. So went to bed. He went out after that, and uh, next morning we got up. Went, that's when we went to the swingers breakfast. <laughs> oh, anyways, so the, oh the next morning, um, we get up and. and Lo and behold, Tommy, we were just like punching your GPS, whatever, closest diner. And we were like, you got to be fucking kidding. It was almost like someone wrote the fucking joke. <laughs> I mean, like, it's called Swingers, and it's like half a mile from the fucking hotel. I was looking for the Chikini booth, but they didn't have one. <laughs> I was going to say, did they know Mark? No, they didn't. But we had the cutest waitress. She was super That's duper. Gorgeous. And what a cool place. So if you're ever in L.A., it's on Beverly Never. Drive. And great food, really cool food, and a very, very much a like a was it like a fifties diner type of theme in a way? Yeah, with, I don't the, know, key, just... with the key bowl. <laughs> yeah, with the key bowl. Yeah, uh, well, it was just cool. Uh, oh, something that was really, really weird though is again we were staying on Beverly, and Eric asked like, "Where you got, you know, where you guys staying?" We're like, "Well, I'm over at Beverly near CBS Studios." He's like, "By this, by the seventy six station." And I'm like, yeah, the 76 station's on the corner of where our hotel is. He goes, I used to live on that street when I moved out to L.A. And he's like, you know, Peter lived, like, on that street, too, like four apartments for me later on, which I thought was just odd trivia where, where I, for my first time in L.A., staying out there. And he just said, ah, where are you staying? I'm like, oh, yeah, I lived on that exact street. <laughs> and that's when he said, you know, Peter lived on that street, too, which I thought was. So did you go find Peter's old apartment? No, but I'm no. guessing that's if you read Peter's book, uh, that was the apartment where Peter says that he put a, a gun. Yeah, in his I was home. wondering if that would be it. Well, it would have been timeline wise because this would have been in the late 90s or the, excuse me, early 90s. Now, that's not Eric said he lived out there in the early 90s and he said then Peter lived uh, out there, too. So that would have been the timeline for that. Yeah, it's, it was literally right across the street from television studio, CBS, where they do all of the – In I don't know if they do production work there or not, but you know, where, like if you watch Survivor, that end of Survivor where they have all the cast and everybody there and they do it at a television studio, that's where that was. So it, one of the interesting things about driving around to L.A., for those of you that have never been there – is you never know what you're going to see because you don't really know where you are. I can tell you, yes, we are in Hollywood or, or we are in this city or whatever, but we're driving on our way to the convention, and this is how dumb we are. So off to the left, there's like these huge, I mean, billboard-sized posters of movies. And, and I said to Mark, that must be an incredible theater, movie theater. And Mark's like, yeah, it looks huge. Block later, it's fucking Paramount Studios, you know, <laughs> with the big entrance. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. You know, tourists. I was going to say, you <laughs> freaking Midwest tourists. Oh, God. Yes. And uh, so then after breakfast, we headed to uh, the uh, expo. And uh, that was uh, really fun. We uh, walked in. Was that a, here's the cool part. I've, I've been to a million expos. I've never been to a million X. I've never been to an expo that was at a studio, um, wherever they film TV shows and stuff. It was at a lot, a movie lot or a studio lot. Yeah, and, and they it, were per, currently in production with a couple of different shows. I think one for um, AMC and one for TBS or something. And I don't remember the names of the shows, but they were currently doing that. And Castle, 
uh, that TV show that just ended that was filmed at this place. So it was inside of a, of a like a sound warehouse with a bunch of buildings on site. So we had to go through the gates and everything to get to the. Well, it, to was, the... it, was, it was at Raleigh Studios. Right. Yes. But here's the thing. Normally, when you go into a, a convention, a Kiss Expo, or really any kind of a convention, it's in a like a hotel ballroom right. or something. This is in a fucking huge warehouse room with like the door, which would be a wall pulled back. Right. Big so it's, it's like being outside. Yeah, it's not a sound stage. It's like being outside, really. You just you got three other walls in a in a in a room. Yeah, and so, they had a big white screen that had to gone two stories that wrapped around the whole inside corner of one of the corners of the building, and it did it kind of was beveled like this at the bottom edge, so you could tell that they probably did a lot of stuff with that screen as a background using it like as a green screen and it was so huge you could probably tape just about anything there and, the, and that's where the stage was that's where Pris played uh that's where bruce kulik played with Pris. that's where they did uh, a q a um that's where bruce did his q a and they had, they had folding chairs set up in front of that um and on the other corners almost l-shaped were the dealers so if you take uh if you walk in on your right hand side and forming like an L, uh, you had nothing but dealers. And then on the other side, if you want to connect the rest of the L, that's where the stage and the and the seats were now. And then in a separate building across the you had to walk across the alley, if you want to put it or street or whatever the entrance was walkway. Then Peter was in more of a hotel like a screening room. Yeah, like screening a hotel, room. Yeah, screening room. And it was really weird vibe, and I think Tommy would agree with me. Um, it was kind of weird, man. You, you walk in, and you, we had to walk up some stairs, and you had to pay every, you know, pay the person there, and they gave you a little ticket. So, it, trust me, you know, at the old, the Kiss conventions of old, you know, just getting an autograph and everything. Peter or Vinny or Ace, whoever just sat there, you brought in your couple things you wanted to sign, and you just went through. This is the first time I'd ever been to an autograph signing where you had to tell them what you were being, you were getting autographed and they had to either okay it or not okay it. And then certain things to autograph had a more, more, you know, more expensive cost to get autographed, which I, I don't know, it's still your freaking name on it. What's the, anyways, that's a whole different conversation. And then you had to, you know, you had to pay for that. And then you went into the screening room and it was weird. There's no music playing. It's almost like being at a wake. And then you, you, you walk down the stairs and Gigi and Peter were at the bottom at a table and you had to present your ticket. And then they had to kind of almost like, okay, what you were going to get signed. And then even though you'd already gone through the pre-screening process with someone else. Exactly. So that, but here's, and again, this is cool, cool and bizarre all at the same time. At least this is the way I felt. So then Gigi and Peter greeted you. And then, you know, you get your thing signed. And Peter did this for a lot of people, not everybody, the small, t- the short amount of time we were in there. And he gave you a big hug after you were done. Cool. And, yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of surreal, as they say. And then and then that's it. You walk back up to the stairs and, and walk out. And it was... Uh... Did, did you guys go meet Peter? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I felt like he hugged me like I was his long lost brother. I think he was really grateful to be there. He seemed, I didn't, you know, in retrospect, I, I we should have talked to him a little bit, but I really didn't know what to say. And it was kind of put off by the whole presentation of it that. I'm just like, whatever. I, it, it just, I, the last thing we were going to do is tell him who we were. You know, well, no, I was going to ask you, did you, know, did you, Tommy, did you, you tell you, him you your name really in sure. the show? Well, hold on, Michael. Tom, Tommy, you really should share the the story with the because I think it's important. It's a part of the it's part of our experience. Okay, I, I suppose I can. Um, so I brought three things to get signed. I don't have any any stuff signed by Peter. I just have never been much of an autograph person, and that's not a slight on anyone who gets stuff signed. Don't get me wrong. I just don't have a lot of stuff. I didn't keep my collection. Many of you know know that. Back in the early 90s, I sold my whole Kiss collection, took all that money, and put a down payment on our first home. That's what I did with the money. So anyways, there's a few things, and one of them I've had literally for 40 years, and the other one was for 30 years that I wanted him to sign. But I also have uh, my my, um, Sunburst Les Paul that Ace was so 
kind to sign for me. And I thought, you know, it'd be kind of fun to have Peter's autograph on that as well for no other reason than I thought, okay, it'd be cool to have him on that with Ace, whatever. Let me interject so, real quick, just so everybody yeah. knows, it's fifty dollars an autograph. So, you know, you go up, you pay your fifty dollars per autograph, and there was a sign that said. What oh, on sign? the internet of exactly what he would and would not sign. What he will not sign is he will not sound, sign nothing to lose. He will not sign Lydia's book. And he will not sign any drum parts, drum heads, pieces of drums. That was it specifically in great big bold lettering exactly what you couldn't cut. Co- anything else is fine. I'm like, okay, great. So that was the third piece that I brought out with me. And so I had it pre-checked with the gal, and she was like, that's fine. Everything is cool. And then I get up there, and I have all my stuff out, and the guy who was pre-screening again, it's like, well, what's this? I'm like, well, it's my guitar body. Why? What's the big deal? Oh, he's not – no, uh-uh. This is going to be at least $500. So he has no fucking clue what's going on. So he walks over to Gigi and and shows it to her, and she's like, oh, no. No, 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 no. He can't sign that. It's going to be at least $250 for, for Peter to sign something like that. And she was really nice to me, so I don't want to paint her as an evil person, okay? That's not the point here. Um, but I was just like thinking, you know, I flew out here for this event. I'm standing in line. I followed your rules. I did everything that you said you wanted us to do. And now you're not going to sign my guitar if you don't get another 250 out of me after I'd already given him $150. So I said, fine. I, I didn't argue at all. Peter was like completely out of the conversation. I think, yeah. yeah. And so I just said, Okay, then you guys owe me fifty bucks. I, I, you know, I'm only going to get two autographs, and the the, the dickwad that was like wanted five hundred. <laughs> like, well, don't you want anything else? I'm like, what am I going to do with that crap? You know, I brought specific items. <laughs> yeah, I, I I came with specific items that I wanted to have signed, and so uh, you know, Peter was very nice and 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 he, very caring and wonderful. And again, Gigi was nice to me about it. But they had no idea who we were. They probably would have thrown us out. But, she, you know, she's like, I'm really sorry. They should have told you, blah, 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 blah. And I feel, in retrospect, no. you Because they didn't, your first person let me through. I paid the money. It, to me, it's like going and getting um, like a new pump for your, your well, if you have a you know septic and well system. And then the guy bids you $2,200. And then says, oh, well, you know, I'm having a harder time getting this thing down the shaft. I got to, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be an extra 500. It's like, no, you bid it at that. You know, that's what you should do it for. And so it just kind of left a little bit of a, of a sour feeling with me because – and I get that, that, that people are worried about eBay and all that. But, you know, not every fan that shows up to get these things autographed is going to turn around and sell it. And why is an autographed guitar that was never used in KISS – that was a much later model ever going to have any intrinsic value over and above a poster or a record or anything else that's signed. So, I mean, if they're that worried about it, then they should have a whole store online with Peter signing everything. Go, oh, well, you want a Peter guitar? Great, here, you know? And so it just, I don't know. If Mark and I discussed it, I'm like, I don't really want to say anything. But it, it just, it took all of the fun out of it for me with the way it was handled. It was just, it's, it's poor planning. I mean, come on, let's, let's be honest here. Peter's done autograph signings all over the place. Yes. You are not the first person who's probably ever asked for a guitar to be signed. Uh-uh. And they've probably either turned them away or said $250 at some point in the past. Why didn't they communicate this to the expo in advance? Why well, why act surprised? Well, here's the thing, like Tommy said, we already went through Checkpoint Charlie once. Yeah. Why didn't you tell Checkpoint saw, Charlie? He, this? he showed the woman who was the checkpoint lady, this is what I'm getting signed. Okay, well it's not a drum part. Continue. Yeah. And Greg it, bless it, it, Greg Jornigan's heart wonderful guy you know friend of the show we were in line with greg and poor greg he had his back oh, back glass did he get that signed yes but he had the, 
he had to open it up and pull it out and show yeah. her. And it's just in like, Christ. Yeah. I mean, they had everybody opening everything. What are you walking in with a bomb? That that's, you know, it, you probably could have, if you paid extra money, he would have signed that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, well, and, and, and so go ahead. I was going to say to make it even more silly. We were with a friend of ours out there from LA and he, he had two things he wanted to get signed. And, I was just going to go because I didn't bring anything to get. I've met Peter a bunch of times, yeah. was, you know, so I'm like, I don't need anything else signed. You know, I, it was like, they're like, well, you can't go through. I'm like, yeah, because Mark yeah. and I bought bought some tickets for him to get these two items signed. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm here with my two buddies. They're just going in. I'm, you know, whatever. Nope. Nope. So well, you my, can't even my, look my, at Peter without paying. That's what I said. So my, my one buddy just gives me the one picture. So now. That one picture was signed by me, and then the other one was, or like, you know, really? It, and I had three it, items at the time, so I would have needed Mark's help, which he gave me anyways, because I, I, I had to, I had my backpack, my camera, all that. You couldn't take your camera out. You could not take any photos of him. Oh. You could only get a photo if you paid the $40, or you could not take a picture with him. So it was forty dollars for a photo. It was fifty dollars for an autograph, and it was just it. It literally, even though Peter was super nice yeah. and and very gracious, and hugged people and said thank you for coming and take care of yourself and you know get yourself checked, avoid breast cancer. I mean, the whole nine yards. It really it sterilized the event to the point where I felt like we were. It wasn't a fan experience. It felt like. Uh- Grocery store checkout, uh, but but even... but more insulting. Yeah, and, and, you know, and 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 so I just left there going, "This sucks." You know, I was just bummed about the whole thing, even though the experience itself was great. And then one of the guys that was with Greg uh, snapped a couple photos of Mark and I with Peter, and then they caught him, and they're like, "Put it away," and oh, you know, Jesus. all that kind of stuff. Huh. Yeah, it, it, and this was this had to have been all under you know, Gigi's control from what I could tell. But again, she was very nice to me, but I didn't argue because I thought, you know, this just isn't worth it. And we, it, we made no stand. We just kind of went with the flow. Right. But it, it, we walked in, we're all excited. It was kind of, you know, really. And, and as, as Tommy said, and to reiterate for the millionth time, cause we're going to get this. Peter was great. Gigi wasn't a bitch about anything. She was but very matter of factly, this is how much it's going to cost. But again, you already went through the checkpoint once. Then you had to go through the checkpoint again, and you had to present your little ticket. And it, I'm just taking this as somebody who's been to a million Kiss autograph signings through the years, be it Bruce Kulick, Peter Chris, Vinnie Vincent, Ace Frehley, Eric Singer, all the way on down, Bill Coin. All those people did autograph signing, signings at Kiss Expos. And not one of them, at least back in the Kiss Expo glory days, you just went through, said hi, shook the hand, got the picture, you know, autograph. that was it. Because you paid to get in. You know what I mean? It, it wasn't. And, and, but I don't begrudge him doing that. And it's probably, it's the first time I think I've ever paid for an autograph. Because I wanted to complete a set, which I know all of you folks listening understand that. You want to get all four. But it just made me, it made me feel like a creep. I because admit, Tommy, that was one of the reasons I I just refused to participate in that. It it bothers me down here. That's and me too. But it was oh, this is the last time I may see him. That, I've, yeah, I've been that, waiting that, for thirty that, freaking years. If you, one, if you miss that one signature, I get it. You you got it. You know you got to do it. But there's just part of me that I won't I put it this way: to go to an event to get something signed if somebody's there and they're just signing, cool. But to go through the regiment, what we went through, I I just refused. To what they should have done is they should have charges charged an extra fifty dollars for the expo itself, and that fifty bucks goes to Peter. And everyone who wants an additional item signed other than that one has to pay. But like I said, the whole setup made me feel. I don't know. It it, it was just really kind of frustrating, and so this thing went on all day, and it was so. That piece of which this had nothing to do with Derek. Derek did a great job. I want to say that putting this whole thing together. This was on their own without Derek because that's why there was a separate room and all that. That shit went on. Some of our, our listeners were in line for five 
hours because some asshole showed up with 85 items. And it's just like you couldn't have done him at the end or taken him the night before. I mean, for four grand, he should have spent – you should have had dinner with Peter, <laughs> you know, and, and and had time to sign all of these items. Because Peter, in his defense too, was taking time for every single person and was putting everything into the, making sure the autograph was really good and all of that. Because I had met him before and he, I, I had a, a picture disc that was going to complete this piece I'm talking about. And he signed on Gene's face. And I'm like – motherfucker you know i don't care how pissed you are at gene don't sign on his fucking face you know and so these poor people some of them waited for five hours to meet peter and it, I, it just i and would have done let, it let me make peter. let me make sure because there's probably some some people listening who are going to think this you guys weren't expecting any special treatment because you're three sides of the coin you waited no. in line you paid. We never do. You didn't even tell them you were three sides of the coin. I wanted to get we my just... autograph. Yeah. <laughs> I was fearful if we told them <laughs> that yeah, they're there gone. Was, there was, no. And, and I also want everyone to know this. We're going into detail just because this is something very detail-oriented. The, our experience, and I know I'm speaking for Tommy, was a 10 out of 10. We had a ball. It was great. But this little micro part of it was the only downside, if you want to say. And it didn't ruin anything in the big picture. No, but you not guys at all. like the minutiae. We're telling you down to the to well, the hair just, of the you're, deep. You know, we've always but said we we're gonna be we're gonna be honest. Honest, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, yeah. I just want you guys to know a couple things. Uh, Tommy just said Derek Christopher, our our guest who was on the show, did a phenomenal job. Great location, did everything he could to make it as nice for everybody. He did a phenomenal job for a first convention. It was great. And if he does it again next year, you guys have to go and support it. You have to. It was fun all day. It was great. It was phenomenal. And and trust me, and also we talked to people who did the Friday night meet and greet with Peter, said, what did we hear? Nothing but incredible stuff. Mm -hmm. We heard nothing about incredible stuff about the tour after. We are just micromanaging this our little, experience. Yes, but and yeah, everything every, you just heard, you could say in court because there's no gray area. Everything we just said is exactly as it happened, and this was only what twenty minutes out of our entire day. Yeah. But oh, did, absolutely. It did it, but both of us. And again, I went up there just hanging my, you know, hanging with my buds. Walked up there. And right at the first checkpoint, Charlie, you can't go in. I'm like, what do you mean? I yeah, can't? we're just like, hey, out of your mind? What the hell? He can't. He's because <laughs> you're, you're carrying stuff for us, helping us out. It's just yeah. that really pissed me off. Yeah, you know, geez, I'm just helping my buddies out. We're all here together. You know, we're here. What do you, what do you mean? You so have the, to have a, you have to have this ticket, and you have to pay fifty bucks. And I'm like, and the Friday night thing apparently was fantastic. Rob Zombie, John Five, everyone showed up. Badly. But it sounds like you couldn't take pictures or video there either. Everything was micromanaged and controlled. So I'm not going to say I'm angry because I'm not. I was disappointed and heartbroken over it. I would say and that's. I want I, I want to get more details of the expo day itself, but I did want to add that I saw a couple. Um, live videos that some of the fans posted from the bus tour the next day. And that looked fantastic. It was a, it sounds like the, it was like a full size custom bus. It Mm -hmm. wasn't a little van. It wasn't a cargo, anything. It was a comfortable bus. Um, There was one clip that was freaking amazing. Peter was singing Beth with the people on the bus. They were, he sung Beth to them and they all sang along with them. But there was video clips of that. There was video clips of them stopping at Guitar Center, and Peter took them in and showed them the Kiss display and was explaining stuff. They took group photos at every one of these stops. It looked like a fantastic event that was put on with that bus tour. Well, yeah, and and, and Gary, who is a friend of the show, uh, Dave's buddy from Ontario, from Thunder Bay. Oh, okay. Yeah, Gary did all three things. So he, I trust him to tell me what's going on. And he said the bus was absolutely fantastic, but it sounds like the vibe was completely different. There you could take video. You could take pictures. It was like what it should be for a fan experience, 
you know, and it's like with the Peter thing, when we met, they were pretty much like the minute you were done, even though there was three, 200 seats there that people should have been able to just sit and watch. They threw everybody out as soon as you got your autograph. You got to go, got to go, got to go. And it just that was the thing. These people were waiting out in the sun and you were in a theater with what would that thing probably had 500 seats in it? Yeah. Yeah. It was like going to one of your multiplexes. Yeah, you know. like you would go see a movie in. So why didn't you have those people sit comfortably and there and go row by row? Yeah, and get signed. exactly. Just, again, again, the, we're just telling you as it is, because I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression that this this thing wasn't a huge success and this thing wasn't totally fucking cool. It was, except for that little part. Right. That was it. Yeah. Everything else. And, and even once when we were done. With that, we both kind of went, well, that was kind of weird. Lame. But, but wham, right after that, fun, fun, fun. We Yes. Know, it, so, it, it, yeah, so let's move on from that piece. So then uh, the, the convention itself, what a cool location. And Derek even asked me, he's like, well, what do you think? Should I, you know, I'm like, yeah, to keep it here because it's different. You're on a studio lot where they film TV shows. How cool is that? And so the only thing I would say that was uh, would be a complaint for me with the convention, and I said this to Derek, and it's not his fault because when you've never had a convention in, in a city, be it L.A. or whatever, it's very hard, I think, the first year to find dealers. So he had – Good dealers, and there was probably 10 of them there, but it would be great if he could have found another 10. So now if he does it next year and word gets out because it had a, he had a really good turnout for the folks that showed up, it would be wonderful if they had twice as many dealers there for the people to look at and buy stuff. Now, now Mark, you were saying you were looking forward to this to see what West Coast dealers had versus the East Coast dealers. Was there anything special, interesting that you saw at the dealer tables? I, the standard fare. I mean, I hate to say it. But to be to be honest, though, I just I'm spoiled because I like I said, I was going to these things in the late 80s all the way through. I, I saw the golden years. Um, I specifically other than to hang out with Tommy and, you know, and, and have fun and stuff. I specifically went out to see if anything was picked over, because if you're a kiss collector, especially back in the day, some things were regional. Like, um, had some of them had regional stores, and I, I can't pull the pieces. I'm gonna figure out one over the wall there. Um, Sam Goody had stuff that like Music Land didn't have. Right, right. right. It's the best for promotional pieces. So I didn't know if maybe there was stuff from Tower or whatever that I was gonna. I don't know because we didn't have those here. So I was I was hoping to maybe find um some stuff but i, I really I, I think i spent a record low on <laughs> just stuff at a kiss convention i i uh i bought a really cool ibanez poster i didn't have but it's it's newer it's small but you know trying to think um really didn't buy too much i you know matter of fact i bought some non-kiss stuff i bought more non-kiss things than i i bought kiss stuff which was odd but i was happy with the stuff that i i found you know um well, and I think there was—it seemed like there were so many people there that were ready, willing, and able to spend money that a lot of the dealers sold out of a lot of items right off the bat. What you know? What I would I would suggest um, if if for Derek to do next year is maybe help get the band get involved, get uh, you know get the Kiss Online out there with their line of stuff, and you know what I mean? Because that hasn't hit the West Coast. I think that would be a a, a great thing, and uh, you know. Again, though, too, guys, uh, Derek Christopher, 10 out of 10, he did a great job. In, oh, in, yeah. in, guys, in your, their- in your opinion, do you think the dealers did okay? Because I think that's a big oh, that I think that's a big impact whether a convention happens again next year yeah. is if the dealers made money. Looks like it. You know, sure I, yeah, it, was, yeah, it looks like they were right? selling stuff. You know, Ken Sharp sold a lot of stuff. Oh, not Ken, I'm sorry, Ken Sharp. Ken Kelly. Uh, Ken Sharp well, yeah, was there, so, so besides nice the dealer, guy. besides dealer selling merch, who were some of the other exhibitors, guests that were well, set up there? Well, Bruce, Bruce was there signing all day, and he's as nice as you can be, and he did his question and answer. Just Bruce is just a solid, good guy. Um, Roman was there uh, working on uh, getting Bill inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so he was collecting names and, and numbers for that. Um, oh, oh, coolest dude we met. John Hart. The guy is so freaking awesome. He, just wait, you guys. You're going to be. He was telling me stuff. I'm just like. Did you get a picture with him doing this to you? 
No, we didn't do that, but we did get a fo- we did get a group shot. But he did do that with some people, and I'm like, God, that's funny. That's awesome. That, I mean, uh, I, that, just, if if I met him, that first thing I'd be like, John, you got to do that to me. <laughs> you're well, smarter like, than us. If, if, for for those of that's you who why don't I know, run the show. For those of you who don't yeah, know, whatever. who John Hart is, you, if <laughs> if you're a collector of or have seen lots of Kiss photos back in the '70s and, and '80s, he he was a very very big man, heavy set, big, real big. He's their famous it's bodyguard. Fun. He's a yeah, famous body. Anyways, I said, I'm like, God, you look so great. You lost a lot of weight. I go, you're like, what you say? I'm like, because, you know, I, it goes cancer and a heart attack. You don't oh, want to geez. do that. <laughs> oh, that's not the diet you yeah. want to go on. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what he said. I and mean, he said it so flippant. It was, I mean, I'm sure people have asked him that before. I thought it was rolling. Did, so did he do oh, yeah. a Q&A? Yes, he did a Q&A. What, what um, kind of stuff did he talk about? Anything, any interesting discussions, stories? All kinds of stuff. And, and, you know, he's going to be he's writing a book right now that's going to be self-published uh, that will be out sometime in the middle of summer. So he's going to come on and we're going to get the, the poop. He actually, they, uh, they said they're probably like to come on a couple times. Uh, give yeah. us a little bit of a, a heads up and everything. And I, let me tell you, I don't know if you want to call John's manager or whatever nicest people you ever want to meet oh god we just met the coolest yeah, and hit it off right away you hit it off right away with these people also yeah. want to give a also want to give a big shout out to julian him and tim were there uh, yep. selling their books and nice as can be they had their, their faq thing over there and talked to julian for a while and that was happy i've never met him before uh, and he was to happy to be there too. He was like, "Gosh, I can't believe I haven't done this for so long." And I'm like, "Well, you know, it's not like someone's going to come and put a knife in your eye." Yeah, you know, so it, it was all positive for them as well. I said, "The nice people are here." And you said Ken you know? Sharp was there. Yeah, yeah Ken Sharp. I, I, I only got to talk to him for what two minutes. Yeah, great guy. Um, the guy oh. we had on from the Detroit Rock City movie uh, that day. Tim. Sullivan. Oh yeah, Tim Sullivan was there. Tim Sullivan was there. Um, and and Moose was there selling. Well, Moose was there with books. <laughs> Did you go introduce yourself? No, I got I what to no. And he was really nice to us, you know, when when he came up. Oh, no, I, I mean, say, we but... listen. We said afterwards we would be more than happy to have Moose come back on and and talk and share his stories. I mean, from that interview, which if I recall was. Based on my Facebook memories, I think it was about two years ago this week that that interview Could be. happened. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and he was Moose always. Was and don't get me wrong, Moose, Moose is great. a nice guy. I just didn't. I didn't say anything to him. Um, well, there was quite a few, quite a few um, ex uh, or not ex. What would you call them? People who've been on the show. Bruce was on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we uh, hung out with uh, Andrea from uh, oh, from, from Chris. Chris? Yep. Yeah, hung up, um, watched them, and they jammed with Bruce, which is, matter of fact, Tommy filmed, I think, if not all of Bruce. No, so, I did a, I did two live Facebook feeds that day, but both of them, it was very hard because of all of the metal in the building. I was having a really hard time getting a strong enough signal uh, to do it for, for very long. But I did, I did do a couple of videos, and it's on our Three Sides page. So you can find it, scroll down, and give you a little bit of an idea of what the expo looked like. But we, I wanted to do a live feed for Peter, just say, hey, here's Peter, this is what he's doing. But it's like no cameras, no nothing was allowed. So I didn't even ask. And like I said, I really wanted to get my stuff signed. Yeah, so we watched uh, Pris played, and people seemed to really dig it. They had people clapping along and singing along, and they were uh, great. did a great job. A lot of fun with them. And um... and then Bruce played with them, which was awesome. They did God Gave Not Rock and Roll to You. Sounded fantastic. Yeah, I know, because you guys know the, the melody vocals there in that uh, second breakdown towards the end of the song, where there's a lot of harmonizing going on. They nailed it. It sounded really, really good. I was... I even told Andrew that I said that I was surprised. I thought you'd almost either skip that, skip that part, or have just one person sing it. But no, they they nailed the the vocal harmony. There it was really it just that's musician stuff. I that's not easy to do, and especially Bruce said they just re- rehearsed one time before that. So they, you know, it was really cool. Again, they nailed it. I thought it was, thought it was really cool. Yeah, and so it was just—it was a great day all the way around. And then Bruce did his Q and A as well, and it was just—it was really well done. Derek did a great job, and if he does it again next year, I would go. 
I'm, oh, I'll be there for sure. Yeah, we, so, Mike, and, Mark, and I had so much freaking fun. It was great. Now, here's something too. Again, much like the cruise and everything else, if you were at the show and you met us, thank you, because you guys are the nicest motherfucking people I've ever met. Oh, we met great people. You met a lot of fans. So nice. Oh my God, did we meet the fans? And each one, every bit is nice. And Tommy, tell the story of the one gentleman that that that. This kind of shit just breaks your fucking heart, man. Okay. okay. But yeah. before I say that, I want to uh, mention to you, Michael, Ben was there, our golf playing buddy from Vegas, and he said to say hi. Um, okay, so this gentleman uh, came up to me, and, and he, he introduced himself. And I, I'm sorry, if you're listening, I apologize. I don't remember your name. Dude, you met so many. How can you find Yeah, he was, mar- he was wearing a monkey's T-shirt. And if I get this wrong again, I'm also I'm apologizing in advance. I'm just from what I remember. But I was so moved by this story and so deeply humbled that I'd forgotten some of it. So he said who he was and that he he's a big fan, listens to the show every week. Well, he's been battling diabetes for a long time because he said, you know, I feel better now. I've been having some health issues. So I was like, well, what, you know, what's going on? He's like, well, I've got diabetes. And he said, one morning I woke up and I was blind. I had no sight in either eye. And now for fast forward, I don't know, maybe six months or so now he did have some surgery. They were able to restore uh, sight in his right eye, but his, he's still le- blind in his left. So he did get his license back and can drive. But he said, you know, I'm, I'm scared and, and, and upset and, and lonely and, and everything you must go through when something like that. I can't even imagine going through that. And he said during that time before the surgery, his sister would come over and she would queue up three sides for him. And he just said, thank you. You helped me get through one of the hardest months of my life because I knew that if I listened to you guys, he said, at least I could talk about Kiss. And he said, you guys make me laugh. And it actually helped me. So thank you. And I'm just like, oh my I God. I just was blown away by that. That's so, so touching. It is. I just, I'm like, what do, you, what do you say to something like that? That is just unbelievable. And and so those are the kinds of things that we hear. I mean, yeah, we get some people who hate us and great, good, whatever. And, but Look at Mike's it's, smile. <laughs> yeah. But, but honestly, it's the love and appreciation. They hate me. Please. They don't hate you guys. They hate me. Occasionally Maybe they so. hate Mark. Nobody hates okay. Tommy because Tommy just doesn't do anything to get anybody emotional. Yeah, well, why would I? Um, so it's one of those things where I, none of that is lost on us. Every single person that came up to us and introduced themselves, we appreciate every single one of you and thank you from the bottom of our hearts because you guys are what make these conventions and these outings so worthwhile. It was so much fun. And just everyone is so incredibly nice, period. You know, And we are the luckiest three guys that I know that have been – able to just basically fall into this pot of gold and it's all because of you. And so we love meeting you. And it's so funny because so many of them are like surprised. Like they think we're not like that. We're nice. And it's like, I don't, well, they haven't met me. Well, yeah, but that's a whole nother, but they would expect that going in that you're going to be a dick. (laughs) But the, but the point is, is that, and I said to them, we're you, we are you. We're just fans. We literally are. Yeah. We're no different than any of you. We were just dumb enough to start the podcast that happened to actually took off to the point where you folks are, are finding us. But man, we appreciate each and every one of you and, and sincerely thank you. It was another wonderful uh, turnout. And, and Derek said too, all day long, nothing, three sides, three oh sides. He said that. Yeah. He's like, I can't believe how many people came here that mentioned your show. So I think he was surprised in the same manner in which um, uh, Peter was. Peter as well, yeah, Peter Arquette, not Peter Chris, uh, about that because the same thing happened out in Jersey. You guys showed up in droves, and we are so honored. And what Tommy said that we were just leaving, and we didn't mention any. We we're just like, hey, thanks for having us. And he just he's like, I cannot believe how many people mentioned three sides when they, damn, you know what I mean? And saw you on the show, and blah blah blah. And he goes, wow, I was just kind of overwhelmed by it. I'm like, thanks, man. That was a nice fucking thing to say. You know what I mean? It just. Maybe we should have a three sides of the coin expo. No. We'll have it here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at exactly. Mark's... At Mark's place. God, Liz, you know Liz, Liz can provide food and drinks. Yeah, we can have a meatloaf um, communion. Meatloaf buffet. 
a ketchup. Yeah. I told you, I told you, I because I, I don't, I don't talk to, I, I'm, I never talk to my neighbors or anything. And we've had a couple. Is this the house with all the kiss stuff? Go and see it. I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know. <laughs> is this the, is this the really swingers' funny. house? Nice. It's the cherry pit. <laughs> Can I come in and leave a so, key? Right now yeah. it's the kiss pit. I've got so much kiss pit. fucking shit laying around. Oh, he was trying to stuff all of his shit into the bag well, on our way home. Like... <laughs> I, I bought some kiss stuff. Got some kiss stuff elsewhere, and and I'm trying to get it in my fucking suitcase, and it's just not working, man. I'm like, what? The and he's like, is... do I really need these pair of pants? And eh, you know, <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was quite an adventure. He actually had to ship some stuff home. I did. I, matter of fact, but yeah, I, I'm like, I gotta go hit UPS. So. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. The, so again, great convention. Highly recommend you go. If they do it next year, I'll be there. Peter was super nice. Derek did a great job. So don't take the small amount of negative negativity that we were just sharing with you out of proportion. Yes. Yeah. It was. So a... then, then, then to continue on uh, on that night, then we went to Amoeba Rec. No, we yeah we no we went to that. What was that burger room? Oh, we went to Burger Rim. We were driving around looking for a place to eat, and we were going to go to Koreatown because we were very close to that. And then Mark dialed up something. We're like, that's some some Chinese food. So we dialed up a place on on, uh, his (laughs) GPS, and we kind of slowly rolled up to it. And it's like there is a Saturday night at, what, 8.30, 9 o'clock, or maybe even earlier. No, it was earlier, 7, 7 7.30 nobody there and we're like oh that's not good you know so then we just kept driving and mark's like hey that looks clean it's well lit and there's actually people in there it's got the and word it was, rim on its name and it's got the word rim on it which he loves yeah, i'm a big basketball so, fan nice job that's not no <laughs> <laughs> it's basketball Ba-doom, boom psh. so uh we pull into the place and it's the first one and they're going to go chain wise so it's like it, it's like if the bellagio hotel in in las vegas had uh white castles that's what this place was like and so you could get one two three burgers they're probably about like this big and they come in a little box but they're heavy. and they're, they're heavy and just incredible food and all kinds of different uh choices of condiments or whatever you wanted on them and then their french fries were like whole sliced potatoes that were sliced like a thick potato chip and that was their french fries it was just outstanding hold really on, good hold food on. hold on i gotta tell that story so the waiters bring in our fucking food over i order a fucking salad and hamburger and he orders fries and he just looks like he's got me puts the fry one right in front of me i'm like fuck you <laughs> And when, oh, and then when we're leaving the hotel for the convention, because we split a room, two two queen size beds. Mark sleeps on top of the covers. He never <laughs> sleeps under the covers. So we're walking out the door, and I turn back, and my bed's all messed up, and his is like brand new. I'm like, dude, do you know how this looks to the maid? <laughs> <laughs> Why do they need two beds? I don't understand. They look like they're in love. I'm they're thinking of the sign. I'm thinking of the Seinfeld episode of George Tuck or No Tuck. Yes, <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, so I, then after, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, because that shit didn't even dawn on my head. We're walking, everybody's real close to me goes, dude, look at that. This does not look good. And I'm like, <laughs> and I, because I do, I sleep on top of cover. I don't, I hate anything on top of me. So I, I just sleep with a pill. <laughs> and here it is. My bed looks like the day you fucking made it. <laughs> this is, I'm like, oh, fuck, that looks terrible. <laughs> So then after dinner, um, we uh, weren't sure what we were going to do, and we didn't want to drive, you know, out to the rainbow or whatever that night. So we, we ended up going our feet all day. We, yeah. So yeah. So we were going to hang with Eric, and it didn't work out. So then we decided to go to Amoeba Records because I'm like, you know, time is running out. We only have another day or so left. We got to get there. And sure as shit, we walk in, and he's just like, I'm like, yeah, no shit. So they kick us out at eleven o'clock because uh, they're closing and. Sure enough, the next day that we went and ate breakfast and went right over to Amoeba again because there's actually I, we didn't eat breakfast Sunday. We didn't. We only oh, ate that's one. Right. We didn't because we knew we were going to go to to lunch with Eric, and so we went right over to Amoeba. And I mean that I could stay there all day. And we did. We were there yes. for quite a while. And it takes me back to childhood because the interesting thing about Amoeba is, is for all of the stuff that it has, the one thing that it has that at least a lot of the record stores locally don't have is the amount of vinyl. 
and I don't mean used, but new vinyl sealed. So you could go to Van Halen, Kiss, Cheap Trick, I don't care, pick an artist, and they've got almost every single release shrink wrap brand new in vinyl. So it felt like being a kid in a record store again. And someone was saying that they sell about a thousand pieces of vinyl a day, which is huge. So we both like spent a bunch of money there and, um, yeah, so take it from there. And then, uh, Eric, uh, told us a cool place to go eat. We had some, we went to this Thai place. I was not sunset, I think, or whatever Thai palace or whatever it was. No, it was the palms, the palms, Thai palms. We, we met Eric over there and we, I'm like, cause I like Thai food, but keep in mind, I live in Michigan and you know, Detroit isn't like a Thai, you know, this this is the real fucking deal. So Tommy and I were like, well, we don't eat this stuff a lot. So Eric just picked a bunch of stuff that, you know, we all shared. Holy shit. We ate like fucking kings, man. We that was just fucking, what he, we, he must order like seven plates of shit. Yeah. We were just like, whoa, yeah. This is a beast. Yeah, well, he went into a food coma. Yeah. So we literally food it was phenomenal. And, and again, we just sat there and we talked. We left at a good time. And later that night, we were, uh, um, well, got to back, go back to when we were saying our goodbyes at the Kiss Expo on Saturday night, Andrea from Pris, who is also a former guest on our show, said, you guys are going to Ace, you know, can I go with you? I said, yeah. So we got a hold of her. And uh, after we had lunch with Eric, I don't know what we do after that. Then we went driving. Oh, that! Oh, that's right. That's when we went up to the mountains. That was so we I, went. Yeah, we, yeah. We took him. Oh, and broke, and, broke back. Uh, <laughs> he was asking where that was. I said no. Uh, I took. Well, I took him up into the Hollywood Hills, and I took him up on Mulholland Drive, and and so I'm like, "Do you care where we go?" And Mark's like, "I'm happy as hell." So I just started punching stuff in, and then I were winding up this small, quiet, exclusive road. He's like, "Where are we?" I'm like, "We're at the Tate House, man." So we went to the gates of the Tate House, which was like super creepy. So for those of you people who don't know what the Tate House is, that's where the Manson murders happened in 1969. So and then we drove around. Uh, so what that and then we went up into the Hollywood Hills and we were driving on Mulholland Drive all around. Did, you can come see on, your Kiss City. fans. Did you go drive by Gene or Paul's house? No, we did not. No, uh uh-uh. uh. You're not real fans. Apparently, we're not. We could have had, we, you know, we should have had like um, a picnic lunch or something out out there. We just didn't think of it. But it was cool just to see the sights and see what it's like. And like yeah. I was telling you with the Paramount thing, you keep running by these places. You're like, oh, hey, I've, I know that. I know that. I know that. You know, it's like like like, like Bob Singer saying, I was just a Midwestern boy on his own. I mean, you're uh, you're over there. It's just weird. It's quoting a little bit of Hollywood Nights there from uh, the Hollywood Hills. I love that song because I'm yeah. from Detroit and you have to like Bob Seger. So. Yeah, he was singing. Um, I was singing. I all was day. singing in the car. So all day. <laughs> so, anyways, that night, then we go to see the the guitarist that we supposedly hate, who just Vinnie Vincent did a show. Yes. So yeah, no, we it. but we stopped at at Andrea's work, which yeah. was literally right next door to Spawn Ranch, but it was dark, so I didn't get to see anything. I would have loved to have gone to Spawn Ranch. So we had a beer there, and then we continued on uh, to the show, which was, what, about another 15, 20 minutes? Yeah, it was at Agora Hills, which is just past Topanga Canyon. So it would be the very outskirts of Los Angeles, but it was still in Los Angeles proper. So we, we go there. Um, place was packed. And let yeah, me tell you. Talk I've about a crowd. Holy shit. Ace a billion times. Best show I ever saw you really play. Yep. Best. This band right now, and it's funny because he played Emerald, and I think I even brought it up on the show when I saw him over the summer. I couldn't believe how well that sounded live. I was like, there's something special about this tonight. And I think it was when we ran into Richie later on. A couple other people mentioned that song after the show because I was just like, mouth agape just why i couldn't believe how fucking great it sounded and it also i think another reason why it sounded so good is night bob and if you know night bob he was like legend total legend in the music industry he was like aerosmith's personal sound man through their 70s 
classic years. And he's worked with just about everybody. And I actually have uh, some very good friends of mine are really good friends with him. So I talked to him for a little bit. But we sat literally night. It was like night, Bob, Tommy, me and Andrea. <laughs> we, we were sat right next to the. And then the seas parted. It was all, because there were I, tables in front of us. And then there was. It's like a dinner theater on the side. So the four of us little knuckleheads were, well, three because of uh, Bob had. Izzy be. kept running around. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Was going. But I mean, the sound just knocked you out. It was just freaking perfect. Yeah. And so what I meant by the parting of the seas, like Mark was saying, is, is that, that it was the general admission because we didn't get a table. We just went that night. And so I, I kind of nudge him at, in the middle of the first song. I'm like, look, those seats are open because then right after that is all these other seats with tables. And literally sitting right next to the soundboard, we were dead center. And then the people, the security came and cleared everybody out in front of us. It was just like. <laughs> Power of three sides. And so we had like an unobstructed shot of the stage the whole show. It was absolutely the best seats in the house. Fantastic. And the set list Ace, Ace took care of you guys. It was freaking awesome. No, John and John Pat, Pat always take care of us. They are two of the coolest people you'd ever want to meet. Uh, John, obviously, the manager. And then Pat runs all of the merchandise. They're just every, They're all so incredibly nice. They're just nice guys. And even Ace acknowledged three sides on the bus with us. So mm-hmm. uh, that was cool. And he was, it was funny because, you know, I, I, well, he, I he, didn't, he didn't say three sides sucks, did he? No, no. Oh, I know those guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As we were walking in. I know mm-hmm. that show. So it was just cool, you know, because Ace knew who we were and he was, you know, very, he was, it was funny because like I was saying earlier, I, in August when they were in Detroit, you know, I could just tell Ace wasn't in a good mood. It was a crappy day that day. It was an outside gig. It rained earlier in the day. And, you know, so there's what a total difference when we were, you know, at this show because it was a, it was packed. It was inside. Ace was in a great mood, which is one of the reasons why I think he played so damn well. But, I mean, look, I've been seeing Kiss since the 70s. Ace is playing arguably better now than he ever has. If Ace is coming, man, you got to go. I mean, it, was it was awesome. awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We, again, saw a ton of people at the show that oh, are also listening. When I was in the bathroom, tell them the story. <laughs> he said about the, the one three sides guy. Uh, I don't remember. There was just so much funny shit, so you're going to have to tell that one. Hold on, hold on. No, you said, you said, where's Mark? You, some guy came out of the bathroom and said something to you because I was taking a piss in there. And they're like, oh, I just saw a chikini or whatever doing. And you're like. I didn't even. I wasn't even talking to that guy. He came up and said something to me about seeing me taking a piss in the fucking bathroom. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, like Mark, Mark was in in line at the convention because they had a grill there all day and they were selling burgers and all that kind of stuff. And so Mark's getting a cheeseburger. Some guy walks past. He's like, "I just saw Mark at the thing and he's getting a burger. What are they out of meatloaf?" So it was shit like that all day long. And people oh, would walk yeah. by that didn't even talk to us and would be like. Yeah, and just keep keep going. Yeah, it was really funny. And so at the at the show, the same kind of thing. You know, it, it was just it was great, and it's just so fun to meet people. And we, you know, talked to a lot of different people in line that night when they were waiting to get in to see Ace, and it was just it was great. You know, had a lot of fun. You know, and and all the rest of the band members of Ace is they're super nice. Richie is really nice. Same with Scotty. I spoke to him for a while. I met. The bass player, real quickly. Um, what's well, his name? Phenomenal. Chris. Yeah, Chris. 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 I'm sorry, I keep forgetting his name. They're all just nice people, you know. It's they funny run a... I, I leaned over to Andrea and I said, "Look, I hate solos, but watch this bass player do us." He was. Do you know much about Billy Sh- Billy Sheen from uh, David Lee Ross Band or the Talus before? He he's almost right. like the Eddie Van Halen of bass. Right, right, right. This Chris guy, it wasn't like. This is what musician talk, masturbating, soloing. He just wasn't. He, just he wasn't played. doing a Vinnie Vincent just, shit. No. But he played with such feel and precision, and the melody line was just beautiful. I mean, it was like a song in itself. And he's doing this, and I'm like, check this shit. I mean, on a bass, because if you guys know, Andrea plays bass, and she does the Gene and and Pris. And I'm like, watch this shit. I mean, it was like, and we were both like, wow, that guy's really fucking good. You know, it was just cool seeing. Somebody do a solo where they weren't, you know, just trying to go, hey, look what I, it, 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 it was like really, really cool. And again, I hate solos. This solo is really good. So yeah. it, again, it complimented the set instead of like, you know, 
here's a, here's a time for the other guys to get a drink. It really, to me as a musician, I, I love to sing it because you don't normally see that, especially on a bass. Really? I mean, how, how many bass solos do you normally even get? You, you get done, which reminds me of a funny story. My one buddy back when we saw Van Halen in the eighties, he's like, look, man, Michael Anthony's doing this great bass. So I said, no, he's walking on his guitar. Cause that's what he was doing. He like set it down. He's stomping on him. Like, He's not, it's not playing. a solo. Yes. No. Like, it, it was like the next day in school. It was like, yeah, Mike Land is awesome. So I'm like, dude, he was walking on his fucking guitar. I could have done that, except I would have broke the neck. <laughs> did, at, at, at the expo, did you guys um, meet Jay Gilbert? Yeah. Yeah, always. Yeah, we ran into Jay. Um, he was parking his car. We were getting out of our car. Yeah, absolutely. Jay is super, super cool. And he was there taking photos all day. He was the official photographer at the expo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we hung out with Greg, you know, got to see Greg and spend some time with him, which is awesome. Uh, So many ex. It's it's like a three sides of the coin reunion. It it was, there was so many guests there like, Oh, Hey, you know, and, and just every, it's a great community and, and we're all blessed to be a part of it. Cause no, and you guys met, um, Larry, the guy who does all of our voiceovers. Oh, yes. what a, I love that guy. I wish I could have hung out. He was in line. That was an, when Tommy was talking about the long line. He was one of those guys that was in the line for like a long time. I kind of felt bad for him. You know what I mean? Yeah. That that was that, see that was one well, thing we were, we were having all this fun. We'd come out and it's like the line hasn't moved because a guy showed up with eighty five items to have signed. So that's four grand. You'd think they could have like met him the night before and. We already talked about this, Tommy. Yeah, but I mean, it just, it took, it stifled the line. So people (laughs) waited forever to get through. So hold on. So now I want want to get to the end of the night on Sunday. We get back to the, we get, by the time we get back to the fucking hotel, we had to stop by McDonald's and all that shit. We get back and we're like, fuck, we got to be up in like two hours to catch our fucking plane. And I'm like, holy shit. So, but we did it, man. We got, we literally, would we get two and a half hours of sleep maybe? Not but even. it was worth it, wasn't it? It I was. Mean, at the end. It was. But it, it, it was one of them weekends. It was like being shot out of a fucking cannon because we didn't have any downtime. We went here to here to here to here, you know, dinner, lunch, go, 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 go. Had just a freaking ball. Oh, and not to, not to let's not forget here, Tom Jornigan, another three oh, size alumni. We, we had the best lunch with him. Not Tom Jornigan, and Tom German. Tom German. I'm sorry, Tom Jern. Greg Jernigan. I get confused. Tom. Tom, super, Tom super, Tom's super, the, art, super the, art, the art director. Yes. Creative guy. Super, super cool guy. So much fun. Took us to the like the coolest Mexican restaurant. We're talking about talking about where he goes, Oh, this is one my wife and I go to all the time. Let's go there. And we're like, cool. And we go there and we walk in, we're like, cool. You know, it's it was a really nice place. And I, I'm like, just give me a couple burritos and keep in mind, I'm I'm exhausted. I just came off of five hour flight and oh and my flight was delayed an hour too but we we got on the plane and they're like you can't we have to wait so i was on the plane for a, it really kind of put a bummer on the day and i was just tired it was funny too because i'm like time i'm like look go have lunch with tom and i'm gonna go back take a shower go doing something well then we just started doing shit after that sightseeing and going and like i said then we met eric for day it was like go go and by the time the end of the night i was just like well, it's worth mentioning, too, by the way, that even the waiter was just like, what the hell? Because Mark's like, give me two burritos. And the guy's like, they're really big, sir. And Mark's like, bring they're, me two burritos. Yeah, they're not Taco Bell burritos, Mark. No. no these things, I swear to God, were like this, you know? And I, I finished all but like a little My boy did so it. <laughs> you know, just a little bit left. Did, did they know? put his picture up on the wall? <laughs> I tell you what, Tom did give me the look like, there's no fucking way he's eating that. <laughs> 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 I tell you, he's the guy I could talk to forever. He's just a great conversationalist. Yo, yeah. It's super nice. and just, He was yeah. some great fucking Van Halen stories, man. Um, oh, yeah. Again, again, just uh, love, 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 Tom. So, yeah, super, super nice guy. So, again, we're blessed with all these wonderful Three Sides alumni, you know. And also, too, th- a big thank you to all the fans that reached out to me that said, hey, you know, I live in L.A. If you guys need a ride yeah. somewhere, if you need a guide, or if we can help you in any way, please let us know. Or you if know, you of, If you get sick of Tommy snoring. <laughs> that, too. 
I brought my CPAP. And I'm like, dude, you really need one. He goes, I got one. Fuck it. <laughs> well, I thought you'd be sawing logs too. So I thought we were good. But at any rate, it was fun. <laughs> oh, you slept through it. What are you talking about? Snores. <laughs> But yeah, I tell you, a magical trip from down to Stern. We, I'm serious. I don't think we stopped laughing the whole fucking time we were there. It was, no, it was one joke after the other. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. There, there you go. go. That sounds was, like was sounds easy. sounds like the it's two thumbs up for the L.A. Kiss Expo. Yes, yes. Wait. Three if I had a third. It was great. It really was. Mhm. Mhm. Awesome. So. Let's introduce this week's special guest. Yeah, we do. We have a guest. Don't we, we have a guest. There's a whole another big chunk of this show that people are going to freaking love. So I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the best way to introduce our guest. And maybe it's just reading parts of his bio. Do that. Um, this week we are joined by... Danny Goldberg, and Danny is currently the president of Gold VE Entertainment, but he's worked in the music business as a personal manager, record company president, public relations man, and journalist since the late 1960s. Um, he was uh, he had formed Artemis Records, and prior to the acquisition of Polygram by Universal in 1998. Danny was chairman and CEO of Mercury Records. So as I'm reading this, start putting together what his KISS connections might be. He was chairman and CEO of Mercury Records. Um, prior to that, he was chairman and CEO of Warner Brothers Records. And prior to that, he was president of Atlantic Records. Early in his career... He formed and co-owned Modern Records, which released Stevie Nicks' solo albums, including her number one album, Belladonna. Prior yeah, to that, this, is, this keeps going on here, people. Prior to that, Danny was vice president of Led Zeppelin's Swan Song Records and worked with the band from 1973 through 1975. Let that sink in. Vice President of Led Zeppelin's Swan Song Records. Um, he co-produced and co-directed the rock documentary No Nukes, which starred Bruce Springsteen, Bonnie Wright, Rayet, and Jackson Brown, among others. Um, he began his career as a music journalist, having written for, among others, Rolling Stone, The Village Voice, and Billboard magazine where he actually reviewed the Woodstock Festival in 1969. He's authored a couple books, How the Left Lost Teen Spirit and Bumping into Geniuses, My Life Inside the Rock and Roll Business. Um, let's see. He is... His KISS connection goes back to, and he's going to detail all this for you, but his KISS connection goes back to 1976. He continues and comes back and works with KISS during Lick It Up and Animal Eyes. And he comes back again working with KISS during the reunion tour. And let me just tell you in advance, there's some amazing minutia bombs that he drops that at least speaking for myself, I did not know. He confirms some stuff that we've always suspected about Kiss in 76, but he drops a little minutia bomb about Lick It Up era, and he drops another minutia bomb about the reunion. So Danny Goldberg is um, a well-respected music industry executive who's been there since the beginning and he sat down with us for not quite an hour and shared his time with kiss and let me tell you amazing amazing i mean 
you know, thank you for taking the time out to sit down and chat with three Weisenheimers about this little band called Kiss. Without further ado. Without further ado, let it play Danny Goldberg and stick around for the homework at the end because we want to hear what you think. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. So everybody, I want to welcome Danny Goldberg to Three Sides of the Coin. Um, Danny has a long history, I think it's fair to say, working with KISS at various times, not consistently, right? Correct. I was refreshing my memory. There were three different periods, 70s, 80s, and 90s. I touched base. I, I work with them, but not consistently. That's exactly right. So, so let, let's go all the way back to the 70s, <clears throat> your first, your first go-around of uh, working with KISS. What did you do? Uh, they hired me to be uh, their publicist on the album uh, that was called Rock and Roll Over. Um, I had, um, for the previous few years, I had worked for Led Zeppelin's label, Swan Song, and uh, I was best known as their publicist. I mean, I, I did some other things for them. I had kind of an amorphous title of vice president of Swan Song, but it, it, my, my real trade was at that time a publicist. And when I parted ways with Zeppelin, I started a um, PR company that I imaginatively called Danny Goldberg Inc. <laughs> And uh, I think Kiss were my first client. They were one of the, Bill O'Coin, who was their manager at the time, had been a friend of mine. I had been aware of Kiss uh, from the beginning, although I hadn't, I didn't actually meet them until uh, uh, 76 when Bill uh, suggested me to do this. And um, uh, that, was, uh, that was the first time I, uh, I worked with them and the first time I met them. So did as, as a publicist, were you supplementing what the label did and what was the press office, their own, a coin's own PR firm at the time? Were you working in conjunction? No. He created the press office later. Okay. Uh, I, he had me uh, for that album, and then he wanted to start the press office, and... Um, you know, asked me if I wanted to come, you know, inside O'Coin Entertainment and run that company that would be part of it. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to just work for for Bill and Kiss, even though I liked them a lot. I just felt that would uh, not be the right career thing for me. So then he started the press office. I think it was a kind of Al Ross ran the press office. But but prior to that, uh, I was an indie PR guy who they hired. Uh, and um, uh, the... Uh, all of the press went through uh, my little company. Um, the label um, was really not involved with the press uh, uh, for whatever for whatever reason. A lot of artists like to have an independent control their press and not be lumped in with the label. Um, you know, it was kind of partially a mark of prestige. Partially, it was the feeling of more commitment and focus. Whereas at a label, the priorities were always shifting. Um, you know, uh, and that was uh, that was the niche business that I had, and that's what they asked me to do. So, what was your first impression of Kiss at that time? At that point, I mean, I'm assuming you were familiar with them because by Rock and Roll Over, they were pretty much beginning their explosion had started to happen. Oh, definitely. No, they were one of the biggest band, biggest American bands. I think it was them and Aerosmith were the two biggest American uh, bands at the time in terms of concerts and general kind of cultural power uh and uh you know it was impossible to be in the rock and roll world and not know about kiss they were they were uh, vivid um and uh you know i met with gene and paul i mean they were they were the bosses even then uh i later met with ace and peter in a group situation but it was always clear to me that uh, gene and paul were uh had more power in the group than the other guys did. And uh, they were the ones who were far more interested in what I did 
than the other guys. So so I mostly worked with Gene and Paul and, and, and with Bill. And Bill had a guy working for a man named Alan Miller, who was uh, often kind of a another a surrogate for management, you know, in terms of just trying to make decisions about what to do and so forth. And, uh, you know, like a lot of people, you know, by now, these guys have been around so long, it's kind of known what their personalities are like. But at the time, in 76, it was really quite a surprise to me how nice they were, how intelligent, how rational. Uh, you know, they, they clearly were different with the makeup off than they were with the makeup on. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was extremely comfortable, easy conversation to have and, uh, you know, made me feel highly uh, motivated to try to do a good job. Were you even in, in that 76 time period, were you finding resistance of media to take Kiss seriously? Oh, I think that was probably the, the time of the most resistance. Uh, they were, um, you know, you, you had a subculture of people that I had come out of who, who wrote about rock and roll for a living, people who got into the scene in the late 60s or early 70s, uh, who had taste that was pretty much uh, consistent with that of the people who wrote for Rolling Stone and some of the British weeklies like Melly Maker. And, and uh, that uh, subculture uh, uh, definitely looked down on Kiss and thought that they were... Um, uh, not a uh, credible, legitimate band by the standards of uh, the rock press of the time, whether it was the uh, uh, gimmick of the makeup or whether it was the um, or whether it was the, um, you know, uh, they didn't have a lot of instrumental uh, virtuosity compared to people like Eric Clapton or Jeff Beck or some of the other bands. And um you know, they 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 had gotten uh, zero critical acclaim. They had gotten a lot of visibility because the visual was so powerful of the makeup. It was such a novelty. Uh, but, um, you know, they really wanted to try to enter the kind of rock and roll conversation, not be sort of this side show to, to rock and roll. And 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 my background with Zeppelin, I think, was really appealing to them. And, and you know, I had faced similar issues, although not as extreme, with with Led Zeppelin, because it's hard really? for people who are who are uh, younger, which is almost everybody now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, Zeppelin was also not a critical favorite. If, uh, you know, uh, they were they were made famous uh, primarily by uh, FM radio. Uh, the first Zeppelin album, uh, you know, coincided with the explosion of the FM radio format. The press. Uh, again, was um, a little bit older than the fans of Zeppelin. And my feeling about this whole thing with the rock press and their attitude about some of these artists that were so-called not credible in the eyes of some of the snobs had a lot to do. I think it had a lot to do with age. I think you had guys that were 27 or 28, and they were uh, that means they were 10, 15 years older than the audience of 12 to 16 or 17-year-olds. But they still thought they were young. They right. didn't get that they were 20. When you're 27, you don't think of yourself as old, you know, but you're 10 years older than a 17 year old and 15 years older than a 12 year old. That's a huge cultural difference. And the younger people wanted their own heroes and their own their own band. So I, I was very um, that was my wheelhouse to try to be kind of a populist with the press and say, you know, you guys are missing this. This is the new thing. This is what young people like. And. And, and, and then to, to be able to work with people like Gene and Paul, who were so extremely articulate, and, you know, that's a big deal with writers, is people who can talk. Yeah. Well, yeah. and it seems like that's still going on to this day. If you look at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, they're snubbing all kinds of bands that I liked as a kid, still to this day, saying, well, that's not credible. And then they put someone in the Hall of Fame that they're like, okay, they had one song in the 1950s, and I'm sure it's wonderful, but then you have you know, bands that have sold millions and millions of records and they're just ignored. Well, I don't think you're ignored. They sold millions of records. You know, I mean, the Rock and Roll of Fame is a private institution. Uh, it's run by a group of people who have been really made a lot of contributions to the culture, but they have their own opinion. And, and their idea is that it's, uh, you know, they try to combine commerciality with, uh, with uh, influence on other artists and aesthetics. Uh, based on the judgment of that committee. I'm not involved with picking anybody 
I'm not I'm nominating the committee or anything like that. I'm not carrying the flag for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But, you know, people love to argue about rock and roll. That's like a great, that's part of the thing. Yeah, you know, Hendrix sucks. You know, yep. the well, that's why we have a show, because <laughs> lots of people yep. argue about Kiss. Really the best guy. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, this is just the way of the world. And Kiss, uh, you know, um, were populists. I mean, Gene in particular uh, was wanted people to hate him. Because he knew that if some people hated him, there would be other people who loved him because those people hated him. And, uh, you know, that was always kind of part of his, uh, he was an anti-hero from the get-go. And, you know, uh, and, and that's what made them big originally was that that young audience owned them. They, they were all their brothers and sisters uh, were left out because they didn't, you know, get it. Uh, but, but by 76, they wanted to broaden out and, and try to, uh, enter the conversation and you know one of my big tasks was to get Rolling Stone to write about him and um, uh, Rolling Stone had never done a feature article on Kiss and I think whatever reviews they would given them were very very dismissive and condescending and um, there was a writer uh, now he rest in peace he just died in the last couple of years named Chuck Young Charles M. Young was his byline but we all called him Chuck Young who was at Rolling Stone and who, who uh, I talked into doing a piece on them. And um, we had the, you know, Gene at that time had an apartment on um, uh, Central Park South. And for, I, I feel over the years, just as much closeness with Paul as I do with Gene, it would go back and forth at different times over the different decades. I, I, I'm not saying that I like one better than the other. I like them both for different reasons. But for something like Rolling Stone, Gene was the guy. Gene, Gene had that sort of extra wit and edge that, that, that I thought would be the, the one who could kind of make an impact on, on Chuck. So we did it in Gene's. Uh, Gene at that time had an apartment uh, on Central Park South, and uh, Chuck is there interviewing him. And suddenly, while he's doing the interview, the door opens. And I have told this story before, so I apologize in advance to people who know it. I don't have that many stories about Kiss, so i got to use the ones I've got. Yeah. <laughs> The door opened and uh, his mother walks in uh, and uh, Florence, I believe, was her name. Yep. And uh, she had a Hungarian accent. She was a, a survivor of the Holocaust. And uh, she says, oh, Gene, you've got friends over. That's great. I bought you some matzo brai. You know, you should share it with all your friends. And Gene says, uh, Mom, uh, it's not friends. This is a writer from Rolling Stone. <laughs> <laughs> and she um, uh, got his tonality and kind of beat a hasty retreat. And I thought, you know, at the time, you know, wow, this is just an incredible story that Chuck has got because he's writing about the monster. Again, Kiss had, people that haven't even seen them without the makeup. Uh, you know, this was a big, uh, uh, in public, you know, and, and to see this intellectual, thoughtful guy with this machine gun uh, patter explaining what he had done and then juxtaposed with with the audience and the fists in the air and the, and the makeup and then juxtaposed with the Jewish mother. I thought, you know, this is really going to be this guy got a better story than he thought. And then, um, you know, the article comes out, doesn't mention anything about his mother. It kind of uh, had a few good quotes from Gene, but mostly kind of had this apologetic intro you guys probably have in your files where he compared the band to Buffalo Farts. Yeah. And uh, uh, my heart sank when I read uh. it, you know, because I'm supposed to be the guy that delivered, you know, uh, something good in Rolling Stone for the band. This was the number one priority of what I had been hired to do. And so Gene, uh, finally about a day goes by or two and I finally get up the guts to call Gene and I say, um, so did you see the Rolling Stone piece? And he said, yeah. And then there's this big pause. And he says, well, better they wrote that than that they didn't write about us at all. And that's Gene Simmons. You yeah, know? that's a good attitude. <laughs> that's, <laughs> he's the greatest, you know. I mean, he had the greatest attitude about it. It's no accident this band became uh, successful. Well, let's, let's, because I, I, I want to make sure we have time to hit every one of your eras because we're, we're limited on time here. So let's fast forward to the 80s. What, what was your involvement with KISS then in the 80s? Well, in 80s, by 1983, um, they had parted ways with Bill O'Coin, and they didn't really have a manager. 
they had an accountant business manager guy named Howard Marks who wanted to mostly control their business. But the band and even Howard knew there were things that were outside of his purview having to do with the imaging and strategy for the band. And they also had were in decline. Uh, they'd had an album called The Elder, which I really think is a terrific record. I think it's kind of one of the underrated Kiss records, but it was a commercial disaster. You know, it was Gene's attempt uh, to uh, be a little deeper. And uh, the people who were into depth weren't buying it from Gene Simmons. And the people that were into I want to rock and roll all night and party every day didn't really want to hear about elders. So... Um, so there was a there was there was a real crisis point, and uh, you know uh, I had the idea which uh, people around Kiss had been talking about for many many years. It was not a new idea, which is maybe it's time to take the makeup off. And Paul, in particular, loved that idea because he felt that he was really he really cared about his reputation as a singer and as a legitimate rock artist musically, separate and apart from the theatrics and the makeup and this 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 taking the makeup off was 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 a particularly benefited him in terms of being kind of a conventional rock lead singer star guy and he definitely could pull it off so um so although many people had said it before this time when i said it they said yes and um so where, where and, let me interrupt real quick so where were were you working for the record label at this time or were you independent no, by this time, um, I had morphed from a PR company into a management company. Okay. And, and uh, which was my goal when I started the PR company. I just, in the, in the 70s, I couldn't get any to let, anyone to let me be their manager. You know, by the 80s, uh, you know, I'd been around long enough and uh, had enough uh, gravitas or luck that, I was starting to get some management clients. To be honest with you, I don't really remember who else I had in 83, 84, but I must have had somebody. And uh, I got I got Kiss. So they didn't want to call me a manager because of their history with, uh, with O'Coin and because of Howard Marks' ego. So I think my title was a creative consultant. But they paid me, and I did a lot of the things a manager would do. And it was a moment in their career that, you know, uh, was a big deal at the time, which was taking the makeup off. And MTV had really, by this time, become the dominant medium uh, for uh, exposing rock music to, to fans. You know, it, it, it was more important than any individual radio station and more important to, to the, than the press. And we concocted uh, some gimmick with, uh, I think John Sykes uh, was at MTV then, and we concocted, you know, some uh, half-hour special where they were in the shadows, and then the chairs turned, and then there they were without makeup. And there was a, there was, you know, the this there were there were kind of different video director. Part of my thing was to find a video director, and there was a video director. I think his name was Martin Kahan. I know his last name was Kahan, and he did the lick it up video, and it it just placed them right inside what was going on on MTV. It was like a yeah. new. After it was then they're a band. They're just a big rock band. They're not like a gimmick rock band. And and then after that, that was a comeback for them. It went gold. The pre the elder hadn't gone gold. And then after that was um, and now I'm cheating to take a look at it was Animalize, uh, which came right after that. And I stayed involved with them for Animalize. And Animalize was a was platinum again. So they were back up on top with those two records. And then I don't remember why we uh, drifted apart. I just worked for them for those two records. I don't know whether I had some argument with Howard Marks. I never had a bad moment with Gene or Paul, whether it was a turf thing or the argument. But I just don't remember what happened. But we, we drifted away. It wasn't horrible. But I was there for the two albums. And then, uh, and then um, 10 years later, uh, I've been president of Mercury Records. You know, I went from, yes. uh, you, you know, in the early 90s, I went from being a manager to being a record executive and um Dan, and, danny but before before we fast yeah, forward to the 90s too. so i got a I, i've got a question here so a few weeks ago we had um floron who was the band's costume designer for lick it up and yeah. uh animal eyes and and she was a fascinating fascinating discussion and we spent some time talking about and this is what i'd like to get your input on how they, especially Gene, when they took that makeup off, 
they really looked, again, especially Gene, out of place. Like, I don't know how to act on stage. I don't know how. I'm used to being the demon, and here I am out of makeup, and I can't jump around like a demon anymore. Was there, was that something you noticed right away was, oh, my goodness, these well, guys, these guys you know, again, especially Gene, have an issue here. Well, I think that, you know, um, they shifted roles in a way. Paul kind of became the leader of that iteration of the group. Uh, this was Paul's moment. Uh, he was the front man. And uh, he, he, he uh, you know, looks fine with his shirt open. And, you know, uh, he looked like a like a lead singer on MTV. And he really he really could deliver it. And uh, and Gene was a little depressed. You know, I think Gene felt he had lost uh, this magical thing. Uh, but he was also uh, very pragmatic. He's a very pragmatic guy, as I'm sure you know. And he just recognized this is what the band had to do to survive commercially. So he uh, sucked it up, you know. And he was a little more subdued and, and went and went with the program because this is what the band needed to do. They played out that first iteration for however many years, that first decade. And and it, it, it was old. You know, the makeup thing was old. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, this was what they needed to do. And, and we put together a plan and executed it and it worked. It brought them back commercially. He liked making the money. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that was make the money, you know. Well, and so he became a less prominent figure he was still gene simmons uh and paul became uh, more prominent during that uh, era do you, do you remember having any problems dealing with vinnie vincent no no i don't i i gather later on there were problems but vinnie vincent uh was uh, the opposite of a problem uh, i was used to ace who oh danny he froze up Everybody freeze up. Hello. Hello. Him and Peter kind of ruined your day uh, because they were they were partners in Kiss. So Vinny was just like a hired gun, and uh, he did what he was asked to do, and and he didn't uh, expect anyone to care what he thought about the kind of work I did. So uh, you know, uh, for me that was a relief. I I just then I was really only dealing with Gene and Paul officially. In the first iteration, they were the de facto leaders of the group, but technically the other guys had an equal say, and they had to deal with them in a certain manner, the, the fitting partners, even if they were less uh, creative and less um, involved in the business, they were still partners. Vinny was not treated as a partner, he wasn't. So I just remember him being a nice guy and uh, doing his job, and I, I never had any, uh, any issues with him. Well, because the reason I ask that is because one of the things that's been discussed for so many years is that he never did actually sign his contract, and it just sounded like they've gone through a lot of litigation and all that after the years. So that whole period of the creatures through, of the night through yeah. Lick It Up, where Vinny was a member, there was always some turmoil, and that's you no. Know, yeah. That was that was uh, Howard Marks controlled that side of their business, and uh, you know uh, others than me can comment on what kind of job he did or. Uh, you know, uh, I was kept away from all that. I would have loved to have controlled all of it. I'm not sure I would have done a better job, but I would have, I would have loved the chance to do so. But oh, yeah. not involved with any of that. My job was to deal with the label, to deal with radio, because now we wanted to get them back on the radio to deal with MTV, which it's it's hard to. Again, it's another thing with the passage of time that's hard to explain to people who weren't around at the time. But MTV was was so powerful. That was so. Yep. Every strategy yeah. decision. Uh, and then uh, obviously dealing with the t touring strategy and the promoters and the routing and all that sort of thing. But I, I wasn't involved with, with, the, with the legal and accounting issues. So uh, I never had to be involved with those contentious conversations. For what I was doing, which was involved with kind of the imaging and the promotion and the reinvention of the band, he was uh, positive because he just uh, did his part and didn't make any waves in my area. Perfect. So let's fast forward to uh, the 90s. 90, 96 is where you come back in again? Yeah. So then uh, I went through different things in my own career. And um, in, uh, in 96 or 97, I'm not exactly sure which it was, I, um, I, I become president of Mercury Records. Having I was previously president to other labels. So I had done this a little bit before I get there. Uh, 
And, um, you know, Kiss is now on Mercury. The, the uh, Casablanca had ceased to be a separate company. Uh, uh, it, 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 the Kiss contract somehow had uh, uh, migrated to Mercury through the corporate, uh, you know, decisions prior to me getting there. And, um, you know, Mercury had a pretty weak uh, rock roster at the time. It was an aging roster. Bon Jovi was one of the biggest bands of all time and had great success before and after, was at a low point commercially at that time. Def Leppard had, had, had peaked and was pretty much, uh, uh, you know, much weaker. Uh, same with uh, Mellencamp. So I had to find some new artists. We were able to find some new artists. But in the meantime, we had to keep the, you know, we had to pay our bills and we had to be responsible to the roster. And Kiss was there, and the first task I, one of the first things when I first got there was there had been, uh, there had been an unplugged with Kiss, and uh, one of the things that you did when you did an unplugged was to put out an unplugged album, and, for, and there were people at MTV, there was one guy at MTV, I just don't remember who it was right now, who loved Kiss and who talked him into doing the unplugged, but then there were other people at MTV that thought this was really a lame thing for them to have done, and the band was passe, and this sort of a thing. And uh, so I had a, so they were not giving the permission for the unplugged records. So my first job was to ask as a favor for MTV to change their mind about that, which really was, you know, it just took a couple of calls. It wasn't like a war, but I had to do it. And then, um, you know, and then Doc McGee by this time was managing the band. And as a label president, uh, he was just a fantastic manager for me to have to deal with because he was uh, very practical and helpful. We were we were always wanting to repackage Kiss and do different uh, box sets or best of or whatever the hell we could do to to pay the bills for a given quarter. And Kiss Kiss was a you know a very cooperative with all that sort of thing. We'd make it worth their while, but they weren't. They didn't. Uh, abuse it and and i like these guys so much i mean these were people that i had worked with in the past and who as human beings really have been very very nice to me and i wanted to try to to do a good job for them and uh i only have a limited number of ideas in my brain so 10 years earlier i'd had the idea of taking the makeup off and 10 years later i had the idea of putting it back on again not a very i'm sure i was the hundredth person to mention it but i was in both cases i, I was the one where they said yes Listen, and did it you were the right and, place in the uh, right time that was uh, uh that well there's no question that helps you know uh being at the right place at the right time there's no question 50 percent of what i do is luck uh, hopefully the other 50 percent i contribute something to but, <laughs> but anyway we did it at that time i didn't have the same intimacy with them because i'm now running a big label and i have hundreds of people working for me but i i i, I did spearhead that and we did some event i think conan introduced them it was on uh oh, the good. intrepid the intrepid yeah well Danny, uh, let, let me let me back, back you up for a second so i had them present an award on the grammys also yeah that was uh, the, mm -hmm. the first introduction so when 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 you first presented the idea introduction you know when you first presented the idea to put the makeup back on what was the response from gene and paul you know, I don't really remember the details of it, but it was something along the lines of, yeah, yeah, yeah. People have been saying that for a while, maybe now, but maybe, but maybe now is the right time to do it. You know, it was, that was it. It was like, it, it certainly wasn't a new idea. The original idea was the new idea. When Gene thought of the makeup, I think it was him in the early 70s, long before I met them. That was, that was the creativity. But as a business move in terms of the timing, uh, yeah, I think they were ready for it. I think, and in the same way, Gene had been kind of melancholy at the idea of taking the makeup off. Paul was kind of melancholy with the idea of putting it back on. But I'll tell you, he liked it once they put it back on. Because as he said, boy, the years just melt away. <laughs> <laughs> and the money rolls in. <laughs> and, uh, you know, by that time, they were a classic rock band. You know, they'd been around uh, more than 20 years, and they were delivering something iconic. And, uh, you know, they've been on that... Uh, unique uh unique pedestal ever since you know they're one of the great uh, great uh, rock bands of all time obviously uh in terms of their relationship with their fans certainly yeah so. were you surprised by their success of the reunion tour or did you feel like if they did this move you could see forward and go okay this is going to be big 
I, well, I wasn't surprised. I wouldn't go so far as to say that I was sure it was going to work. Uh, but I, I thought it was probably going to work. So, uh, uh, you, you know, I, I, I've been following Kiss now for a while. I had a sense of the audience and it's, I, I, I thought it was a good idea. I wouldn't have suggested it, you know. Uh, but uh, it's always nice when things work. Uh, I've, uh, not everything that's probably going to work actually works. Uh, you know, I, I could make a political comment here, but I, I won't. Cause I probably have different political views than the, I know I have different political views these last 15 years than Gene does. But I love him. I love Gene Simmons. He's, he's been a great uh, friend to me over the years. And I think he's a genuine creative genius at what he does. So Dan, Danny, how soon after the, the makeup came back on did you start having discussions of we want a new Kiss album? Oh, like five minutes later. I mean, that, the whole point was to get a new Kiss album. That was just the pre-promotion. I was in the record business. I wasn't making money from their concerts at that time. I'm no longer on the management side. I'm on the label side. So the whole reason to do it was to get a new Kiss album. But we needed to create the demand for the album by doing these other things. So, were you there when um, the Psycho Circus album was released? Yeah, I think I was there for 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 that. Uh, yeah, I was there for that album, definitely. Yeah. What do you What do you recall about about that whole album leading into it? I mean, obviously, it was billed as the four guys in Kiss record again, but the reality is, it wasn't all four guys in Kiss. Well, again, my concept of Kiss from the relationship that I had with them and the different roles I played was that Kiss was Gene and Paul. And they had relationships with these other musicians. At the time, they were partners. At the time, they were employees. Whatever they worked out with them, they were the only guys I ever spoke to, you know. Uh, and uh, they controlled it, and uh, that's the reality of it. You know, I don't have that clear a memory of that. I know we did it. I know it was part of the whole concept of doing it. But by that time, uh, you know, I had Def Jam reporting to me and we'd signed Hanson and had a number one record with them. And uh, I was involved with Polygram corporate things. And uh, Kiss was like one of a zillion things going on. Uh, Doc was a first rate manager. Uh, whenever he wanted to meet with me, I'd meet with him. And if there had to be a meeting about uh, what kind of radio promotion or a budget for video, I would show up and be supportive because he was very supportive. He was he was he was a manager that everybody at the company liked working with. He, he was, you know, contributed something, and he would he would push on behalf of the client, but not ever irrationally. But I don't really have much of a memory of it. I was I, I was doing a lot of other things by that time. I had kind of done my bit of all right. We got the makeup back on. We got a plan. All right, that problem is solved. Let me go. I was dealing with problems. That was no longer a problem, so I really wasn't that involved with it. That's yeah. I can see that how your role changes depending on where you are in that yeah, particular yeah. situation. Yeah. Before that, I had tiny little companies. They were extremely important to me. Now I was running a pretty big company. By the time I left Mercury, we were the, had the number one market share for the, my last year there, and uh, even bigger than Columbia or Warner's. Uh, that's what I was trying to build towards. Of course, then the Polygram was sold to Universal, so it was like back to the year zero, and I was gone. But I was uh, by '98, I was right in the midst of all that, and uh, so I just I wish I could tell you more about that. Except uh, we felt very good about the reintroduction of them. And with that platform, we knew there was going to be some kind of a market. And uh, it was a pretty successful record. I don't think it was their most successful record, but it was definitely a comeback compared to their previous records and put them put them back in the game. When was the last time you've uh, seen or spoken to Gene and Paul? You know, it's a good question. I was trying to think that it's been a while. Um, and, and it's just, you know, uh, it's utilitarian business and we haven't been, you know, a business used to each other. Uh, but I like them both so much. I hope I get to see them again at some point. Uh, I just don't remember. I think I've seen Paul more recently than Gene, but I, I, I literally don't. I don't remember. It's got to be ten years or more. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask you a question regarding just the record industry as a whole. I'm just, still one of those fans. Five, I'm sorry, five more minutes and then yeah, got it. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Last question. I'm one of those. I'm one of those music fans who loves still going out and physically buying CDs. I like to take it home, listen to it from beginning to end. Oh, you're Considering, the you're the yeah, one. I'm the guy. I'm the guy exactly for on more than one occasion. So my question to you is this: 
um, you know, I, I'm a good friend with Bren Arns. He said to say hello. He um, has taught me a lot about the music industry. But from your pr- opinion, what do you think you guys could have as a whole of a label done differently moving forward now with all of the file sharing and all that? Is there anything you guys could have in retrospect done differently to make things have gone maybe down a different path than it did? Well, let me just preface my answer by saying by the time all of the highly publicized disputes happened with Napster and uh, the period where they considered suing some people who were doing illegal downloading and all of the other things that had been talked about and written about, I was out of the majors. You know, I, I left in uh, in uh, 2000. Uh, so, so all of that drama happened. Uh, starting a few years later. So I don't have any uh, defensiveness about it because I was never in a single meeting or conversation at the majors. The internet was a very new thing when I was there. And, you know, uh, it was it was a secondary promotional platform like fanzines or something like that. But it, it, no one, while I was there, no one had any idea that it was going to be, you know, this thing that we're now part of. Um, so I, 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 I was not in a single meeting at any record company about what to do about it. So, uh, and, and I, I went from there to, uh, you know, I had a year away from the music business. I was in the radio business for a year and then I came back to, to management. Uh, and, uh, you know, I haven't been at a big label in, you know, at least 15 years. So, but I do think that probably there's very little that could have been done. I mean, there were things that could have been done that might've gotten a better publicity than some of the decisions that were made. Uh, I, 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 I don't think, uh, you know, in retrospect, you know, it's easy in the heat of battle, you do things, I, but, but in terms of the fundamental change in the, the economics of the business, um, I always say when people ask me that question, look at the newspaper business. Newspapers had a hundred times more political power than record companies did. You know, every congressman cared what his local newspaper or her local newspaper said about them. And they had uh, centuries of uh, interaction with the elites of, 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 of the society. Uh, and they were wiped out, you know, because the, the wave of technology combined with the financial power of the uh, software and computer business and the uh, bankers behind them and the uh, way that politics and laws are made in this country where people with a lot of money can lobby things through. It was just I, I don't think there's anything that could have been done. Uh, and I, I and we were certainly not the industry, the magazine and 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 uh, and the newspaper industry were hurt even more than than, than the record business. Uh, the record business has clung on, uh, and uh, there are some people that think it's going to have a rebirth in the next decade as streaming matures. Um, so those were some very smart people in completely different businesses that couldn't figure it out. I just think that the uh, the combination of the convenience factor being so attractive to people uh, and the um, and the uh, uh, just sheer muscle that that these other businesses had compared to the computer business, the record business is like one one hundredth as big. I mean, to me, one of the big moments was, uh, I, I don't know if you remember, there was this moment when um, when uh, com- home computers suddenly had uh, CD burners. Yep. And you would go into Tower Records, and in the front, there were stacks of hundreds and hundreds of blank CDs. And, of course, we knew that people weren't buying all those things just to record their own band in a garage. They were one kid would buy the new Kiss record or whatever the big record was at the time and make 10 copies for their friends. And that existed because a law passed Congress. The, you know, it was, it, was, it was not legal, and they made it legal. They, they had the lobbyists. They had the firepower. The Record Industry Association of America, you know, I was on the board of the RIAA for several years when I was at the Warner Labels. I was the Warner representative to the board because I was the guy that liked going to Washington more. And you know, it was this suite of offices. It was like maybe 20, 25 people there. And then, you know, the movie industry had an entire building and they'd have the senators in and watch screenings. And the computer business owned a lot of the buildings. I mean, they were just IBM and Dell. These were multi-billion dollar companies. They just dwarfed uh, the, the political power of the record company. So I just don't think anything could have been done. I think that, uh, that, that you, you know, no matter who was running these labels, 
I don't think they could have uh, withstood the uh, political and technological and financial wave of history any more than the people that owned uh, the newspapers. And you look at the great newspapers that used to exist that are gone, the magazines that used to exist that are gone. It can't be everybody was stupid. I just think it was a moment in history where things uh, changed the way when cars came along. If you were in the horse and buggy business, no matter how smart you were, you know, uh, people like start to like cars more. But that's a great answer, though, because that was one of the things I'd never considered or had with any anybody, con- you know, when we were talking about this is that really how much the larger companies like IBM or Microsoft or whatever, they literally that's operation and bill was what really kind of took things over more than it was the mistakes that the labels made the economic value of microsoft which for years was the most valuable corporation in the world i think now apple has replaced it but these are the number one these are the biggest companies in the world compared to a record company it's like comparing a skyscraper to a farmhouse and uh by the way when microsoft was selling software they were quite good at enforcing the copyrights on those so on that software to this day, Microsoft Word, which I Still use, are. you know, you, you better pay them or they can turn it off remotely. You know, uh, they see. So the idea yeah. that it was technologically impossible to enforce a copyright on uh, intellectual property has never really rang true to me, given that the biggest company in the world of, of, that, of that era was a software company, all of which was copyright intellectual property. But I just think that's the way of the world. You know, things change. And in the 19th century, there were no recordings at all. There was plenty of great music. And, you know, for all the centuries before that. And uh, I think streaming as a consumer, oh, my goodness, it's so fantastic. Anywhere I go, I can listen to anything I want. I mean, I understand why yeah. people like it. I wish there was a mechanism in the society to get artists paid better. And uh, eventually, I think the lawyers and the power of artists will will tip back the balance of power the way it has in the past. But, uh, you know, I get why people want to stream music. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, those uh, I, you know, there are people who like vinyl. There are people who still like CDs, but we're a minority. Yeah, it sort of seems like it. And I just want to see the artists get paid for their work, but I also want to see them get paid so they want to continue to create art and tour and well, play music. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the older artists, like Kiss doesn't sell any more records. They don't never ever need no. to sell another record as long as they live. They make their money doing concerts. But, but, uh, but younger artists um, need the investment capital to develop a career. And uh, yeah, investment capital is just not there right now. Uh, so people figure it out. They get a day job. They have to have a level of commitment that's more intense than maybe people did 20 years ago. I mean, I'm a great believer that car- art and culture survive. They survived in the, uh, the other side of the Iron Curtain. You know, they somehow it survives. But uh, I don't think it's great that, that so much money has been withdrawn from the value of intellectual property. I hope eventually human beings figure out a way to reward creative people again, not just the people who write code, but also the people who write songs and books. But, uh, you know, we are where we are, and the idea, like what you're doing, you know, this show wouldn't exist without the Internet. So, you know, uh, and that's exciting, the the phenomenon of podcasts. There's been also creative explosions as a result of it. So you just go with the flow if, if you work with artists. If you're running a big company, uh, there's a lot of strategic things to think about. I'm not in that circle right now, but I think there's a lot of people that I know that are in senior levels of the music business are pretty optimistic about streaming maturing in the next five to ten years to the point where the revenue starts to approximate what CDs used to generate, which is what wow. I really more care about because then it creates the ability for people to take risks on artists and on marketing and not only sell things that already have a pre-existing audience. Right. Great. Makes sense. Makes sense. Anyway, Dan- Dan- cool. Dan- thank- Danny, thank, thank you having- so oh, much yeah. for the time. This was fascinating. fascinating. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Give thank you. Up, will you? I-, I-, I will send you a link as soon oh, as this we, goes we live. Oh, we certainly will. Yep. I will put it on all my social networks. All right. Thank later. you. Take care, thank Danny. You. Bye. Please do. Thanks, Danny. Have a great week. Thanks. Take three sides of the coin with you anywhere. Download your five-star rated free smartphone app today and listen on your Android or Apple smartphone. Visit android.threesidesofthecoin.com or ios.threesidesofthecoin.com. 
short interview compared to what we normally do, but there was a couple awesome minutia bombs. Mm. Awesome. Like, at least for me, and maybe Mark already Plus it's knew Danny this. Goldberg. Well, yeah, it's Danny Goldberg, but Mark may have already <laughs> Yeah, this known. is like, yeah. Mark Mark probably knows all this, but but that Danny was the one. Well, first of all, I didn't realize Danny had, quote, kind of a managerial role during Lick It Up and Animal Eyes and was the one who suggested taking the makeup off. And then years later at Mercury Records, suggest putting the makeup back on. Like right pace, right time. Jeez. I mean, it's just like those are two pivotal pieces of history that we kind of just nailed down where it came from. Yeah. Well, and I was, I, I've been so looking forward to this interview for, so for those of you that aren't familiar with Danny, he is one of the biggest players in the music industry over the history of the music industry. So for him to agree to come on and talk with us, I was appreciative podcast. for anything we got. Yeah. yeah. For a yeah. stupid little podcast like ours. Are you kidding? And what a nice man. It was just refreshing. He was such a nice guy. I mean, the, so the, the, yeah, the, I, the guy worked for Led Zeppelin. And, yeah. and, and look, whether you like it or not, Nirvana, he was a big yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's even bigger than Kiss. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny. One thing that I know he didn't have to do with, and but I, I always wanted to know this answer, and this is a little bit off um, Danny, but you know how they did the three videos for Rock and Roll Over? Right. Mm -hmm. I'm happier than hell they did Love Him and Leave Him because I love the song. But that wasn't a single. I was I always want to know how come calling Dr. Love was not one of the videos. Cause wouldn't that have made more sense? But maybe at the time when they shot the videos, they were thinking love him and leave him was going to be a single. No, no, no. That's that, but that's the answer. That's the question I want an answer to. I'll give you right. a great again. Um, using uh, another one of my f deep purple, you know, <sighs> smoke on the water was not the single. On that record, the radio just started playing it. They made a they made a video for a song called Never Before. That was the that was the single. That was the one they were going to push. And it's funny that album has Highway Star on it. And I didn't push that. Lazy, Space Trucking, Smoke on the Water. Even if you're not a Deep Purple fan, you probably know those songs. So the song that they filmed the video for and pushed as the single to this. Don't worry, I love the song. Most people have no clue. And I always thought that kind of stuff was fascinating. Right. That It ties in with this. Like I said, Calling Dr. Love was a top 20 radio hit. And they didn't film a video for it at the time. They did for, you know, Hard Luck Woman. They did for I Want You. And obviously they did for Love Him and Leave Him. And I always thought that was weird. I'm just, I'm, I'm like Tommy right now. I'm just like, I'm so honored that Danny took the time to talk to a little kiss podcast about, <laughs> oh. about his history. I mean, I, you know, go back to the beginning of the show where I read you his bio. Uh, you know, Danny is a player in the music business and, and directly involved seventies, eighties and nineties kiss. I mean, he's interwoven in their history so many different times that it was just, this this could have been a four hour conversation. Easily. Well until yeah. I <laughs> tell, tell tell Mark has to eat dinner. <laughs> right. So, well, and sorry, I, Danny, know, Mark has meatloaf. Can... He can't talk anymore. Well, and hopefully he had enough fun that he would come and join us again because I would love to have just a discussion on the music industry and how things worked. Because it's fascinating to me. Yeah, Tommy, that, you know? was my, that was my favorite part, too, at the end when he started talking. Cause that's the stuff I like to know about. Yep, yep. And I it's no that. surprise that he said that Gene and Paul are super nice and that uh, Doc McGee is a super guy and that he fights for his people, but in a really rational way or whatever it was he said. So, But yeah, hey, guys, I agree, Mark. How about back in 76, just going, it was a two-man show. I know, I know. <laughs> Don't yeah. That, that was huge. That was that was that was just great area there. That was a huge confirmation of what we've always known. Yeah. So homework, yeah. homework. Well, they're the business guys. What kind of homework should we have? What what did what did you learn from Danny? What 
What did you learn minutia wise? I think that's a good one. That's good. Yeah. Because I know there's a few things that I was I like, just, like that. I, said, I I I learned a lot there. That was great. So yeah, your 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 homework. What did you learn from Danny? Um, head over to facebook.com slash three sides of the coin, three sides of the coin dot com, Spreaker, YouTube. We are SoundCloud everywhere. Um, check us out. Leave your comments. Leave your answer to your homework. And uh, that's it. Until next week. Three sides. Perfect. We're out. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. For interviews and media inquiries, contact Izzy at IzzyPresleyProductions.com. Download your free, free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. You love the show. Go to iTunes.3SidesOfTheCoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.